Hey, good evening, everyone. would like to call this meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance.
I'd like to ask that everybody please uh, remain standing for just a moment. Um, recently, our community has been hit with a, a series of losses that are, are dear to our heart. So I'd just like to offer a moment of silence. Um, a retired principal from Elmwood Elementary School, Dr. Nancy Cavanaugh. Our own uh, Tom Carton, uh, Director of Security, his mother, Nora Carton, passed. And then we have a student, uh, Amanda Dorsley. She was a graduate of uh, Rampo High School, 1997. So if you wouldn't mind, a, a moment of silence. And we'd just like to take a moment to thank one of our community members, Mr. Jean Donald Mathieu, Mathieu, I guess. I guess somebody can help me with the pronunciation. Matthew, Matthew, correct. And um, so he's the father of a student of Lime Kiln, and he rescued a baby girl from that big fire we had uh, a couple weeks ago. So that's right. So we just want to tip our hat to Mr. Jean Donald Matthew for his heroism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good evening everyone. Big thank you for the East Rampo Marching Band. That was an amazing performance. Thank you very much. Fire exits are located in the sides of the room in the front and the back. In the event of a fire, you will hear a fire alarm at that time. Please move in a calm and orderly fashion to the nearest exit. I will now make a motion to open the floor for public speaking. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Vice President Charles Pierre. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And in opposed abstain. Motion carries. Speaker number one. Hello, I'm a human, I am a child, and I'm a f I am the future. It's crazy how I feel after what a board member said last week. I, am I just a dollar sign to you? Why is that if the public schools always come second? Why are the ones that get the bare minimum? How is that teachers like my amazing teacher, Ms. Cataldo, go beyond far for the students and can't even get a contract that pays for her a best amount. I love her so much. That's why my grades go up. All because of her, I love school. She showed me that magic and uh, education. My education is not for sale. My age, education is not for take. My education is not a game. As you can see, I'm wearing my marching band outfit. I play the clarinet. My clarinet has been played by many students. Don't worry, I cleaned it. The point is, it's been used and it's missing two things. It's not perfect, but it has taken me to places where we are performing. And I can't imagine my life without music. Board members, I demand you to not dare touch music as it inspires many of my peers. We deserve better education. We deserve more fu funds. We deserve better food. My education is not for sale. My education is not for sake. My education is not a game. Do better. Thank you. Speaker number two. Hello everyone, um, my daughter in the marching band. I am a proud alumni from East Rampo as I'm wearing the attire myself. I'm in the alumni marching band and I'm also part of the marching band association of parents. Now, when we're talking about budget, a lot of things are being addressed of what is not important or what is more important. Everything that our children have is important and like my daughter said our budget is not for sale to sale for your communities 
We are one. We're not supposed to be divided. And it's not fair that our kids think that they're second hand on everything. Our classrooms are crowded. Our buses are crowded. We gave contracts to buses that don't even care about the children. IMS on Ridge Avenue and I forgot the cross adjacent uh, road, left a kindergarten child on the stop without waiting for a parent there and just left them. That child almost forgot, ran over. Same as the other child, and I hope her soul rests in peace, the child that got um, ran over by a bus a week ago. We can't give contracts to incompetent organizations that can't do the proper training for their people either. Now, hopefully, the contracts towards the teachers are being addressed. Their teachers are being overworked in the sense that they're taking out of their pocket to give to their children. This is pathetic. And again, going back to what the board member of last week, uh, the last meeting said, that you can't sell our budget to your community. Don't ever say that we are up for sale. We are not. My kid education is not for sale. Our kids our education is not up for sale. We are not a joke, like my daughter said. It's crazy how my 11-year-old thinks that she's a, her education is a joke. She wants to be a teacher. She wants to educate the same way as her teacher teaches her with love, passion, and, um, and determination. We can't push aside our kids. Again, they're not secondhand. They're not a toy that you pass down from generation. I'm an alumni, and there's other alumni here with me today that we are proof that we went to this district and we were able to get a great education because of those teachers. And the worst thing ever is that the more years go, you can see how the district is slowly breaking even to more pieces, and that is not fair. That's not fair for my children or the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number three. Hello, my name is Jaden Kong. I am a junior, the vice, pre uh, vice president of the junior class. Good evening. As a unified community, the East Rump Post Central School District is committed to educating the whole child by providing a healthy, safe, supportive, engaging, and challenging learning environment. An environment that constantly promises to educate the whole child, yet the students' dream and willingness to continue their education deteriorates and differs from the surrounding districts, living in a constant fear of a lack of resources that is accessible to everyone but us. Clean drinking water, proper education, proper sanitation, and the constant thought of foreshortened future an overwhelming feeling of vulnerability and a lack of knowledge for a future of further education. Promised a healthy and safe learning environment, but the lack of foundation is recite that is recited to us every morning, unkept promises to students only hopeful for a better future. From 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., we are in school receiving our daily education. From 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., or even 2 to 6 p.m., we attend after-school activities to further our involvement in school to try and receive the education we don't attain during the regular school hours. We go home after school just to do endless hours of homework. If you would count that up, we spend more than 14 hours on school-related activities. Approximately 60% of our day is wired to school. Hours spent to understand the material that can only understand with the better re resources. Although we come together to speak with Dr. Ellis at our superintendent circle meetings, nothing has changed. We are given this opportunity to have a platform to advocate for our peers with someone who might understand our problems. Yet after these meetings, we reflect and internalize the mistrust that has run rampant through this entire district. Dr. Ellis, our superintendent from one of our meetings last year said, does it really matter that you're not a competitive school? Then of course, who really cares to be a competitive school when you're a school filled with a majority of black and Latino students population that already is viewed as inferior to anyone else? It doesn't matter, really. As long as students are pumped out of the school, school system by inflating the grades so that they graduate, why does it matter that those kids are working away to try to better themselves? The students at East Rampo are still held to the same standards when applying to colleges. There are countless reasons we can give our dream schools before they start questioning why we didn't strive to achieve other opportunities on our own. In a school where we face adversities, we try to make opportunities, but every day our options minimize as we blatantly are disrespected and our rights as students are taken away by this very board of administrators. We speak on the behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union and, and have become tired of this crisis. Thank you. 
Thank you. Speaker number four. Good evening. Uh, my name is Francis, and I'm the junior class secretary. You can't begin to understand it until you live it every single day. Every single day of our lives, we as students fear for our future. We think about how our parents sacrifice everything for our education, but even still, their sacrifices aren't being reflected in our education. The number of times I've heard you can just inform the colleges about the status of your school is outrageous. Why should I have to dwell on the fact that I I went to a school that could not provide a sufficient education and in turn now I have to write a sob story that I can be, so I can be given a chance in life. I want to be able to discuss my fortunes and achievements through my high school career, but those clauses are short lasting. Through unkept promises we make our due diligence to ensure that we aren't robbed of an education that is disguised as segregation. The separation of people, separate but equal, but yet we aren't given the resources necessary for us to have a healthy learning environment as those all across the nation. The challenging learning environment kept up by the desk being held up with a textbook, only sufficient in telling us old stories that aren't modernized to today's time. The constant thought of a foreshortened sure future to be told that you aren't giving a supportive learning environment, yet the environment lacks education, lacks understanding of a community formed of many cultures from countries that differ from the United States. From this district, expecting us to be the greatest education, by, but they tell us that it is all politics. The students in this district, in this district have ambitious dreams, doctors, lawyers, and engineers. Trust me, I would know. I dream too. But why do our dreams have to stay dreams? Our guidance counselors are diminishing these students' dreams with one glance and an unsupportive comment such as, I think this workload is too much for you. Without even giving the students a chance to experience the workload, life isn't easy and it comes with a lot of work. We should encourage our students to take advanced classes. Maybe it would aid our AP and honors crisis. These exact students who are belittled have the strength to be able to take these classes. But with these microaggressions thrown around, they start to believe it. Our education is being held by the hands of the people who have seen us struggle for years and have done nothing to give us the education that every child deserves. The same support that the old textbook offers the desk, it is soon to collapse. We are the children that suffer through this crisis. We are the children who face segregation in the 21st century. We are the children whose dreams have been crushed, who we are the children who can't paint a bright future. To understand and not do anything at all is just the same as the ones who cause the problem of our insecurities. The hands of the people who watch our suffering hold the spirits of the learning that a child wants. So to look at yourselves every day and say that the children in East Ramapo need help and stand there and do nothing at all is another person watching the 19th century unravel again. We speak on behalf of the New York Civil Liberty Union and have become tired of this crisis. Thank you. Speaker number five. First of all, I'd like to thank the young students who came up here and spoke. I'm proud of you for doing what you did. At the last board meeting, it was clearly demonstrated that there's a divide between the public and private school communities. May I remind you all, you all took an oath. You all took an oath to work in the best interest of the children, but it seems like it's being publicized There's only one interest. Working only for the benefit of one community clearly is unacceptable and a violation of your oath. Our public school buildings are dis are dis are disrepair, lead pipes, overcrowding, teaching staff without contracts, low test scores, not enough bilingual teachers to teach growing migrant student population. School budgets constantly being voted down. Therefore, no tax increases in 10 years. And they blame us, but it's not us. It's coming from the private community. There are children not receiving necessary services to help them to succeed in school because of funding. How can you operate a school district without needed funds? We are now faced with Moody's downgrading, our bond rating, therefore making it nearly impossible to borrow money for the school district shortfall in cash. We have so many problems that need to be solved for the benefit of our children. You took an oath to see that they would get the best education possible, but for the last past 10 years, it's been declining. Please remember your oath and let's come together to bridge the divide between the two communities. PTA meetings, parents aren't able to come out and organize as they wish to bring money in for programs, activities for the kids, raise money. 
parents' voices aren't being heard. Principals and everybody else is telling them who's going to clean up the mess, who's going to do this. But if parents are in PTA, they're trying to help and support the community, they're trying to make a difference. This community right here, we're united. We're not going to stop. We're not going to decrease in numbers. We're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to fight. We're going to continue to be stronger together, united. Slavery is over. Yet some of the times, as one person mentioned, they felt like they were in shackles, being overpowered by people that misuse their roles of authority. This is wrong. The discrimination towards our community, our unity community, must stop and end. The publicizing of the board's behavior is clearly stated by certain board members, you don't like us, you're not for us, and you don't care about us. But you stood there and took an oath for us. Thank you. Speaker number six. Before I get started, I just want to say, welcome back, Dr. G, Dr. G. Martino uh, and his team from SED. We are so glad that you are here. You have not forgotten about us. I think we need to clap. Okay. Education is the great equalizer or the beacon of hope for the black and brown children of the East Ramapo Central School District. As I mentioned at a previous board meeting, the selection of a superintendent is the most important job for the Board of Education. The process has started for finding a new superintendent. The parents and community deserve to receive regular updates on the progress being made to find a superintendent. The parents and community need to know what role they will play in the selection of a new superintendent. Our children are being affected if the right superintendent has, is, has not been found. The parents and community are at a point where they know they can't be silent anymore. The parents and community know that silence at this time is not an option. Silence means that we are complicit. Change only will come when we, the community, stand up to demand change. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker number seven. Hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Broncano, and I have lived in the East Aramco Central School District for all of my life. I was a student in the public schools for 13 years and graduated from Ramapo High School six years ago. I want to note that back in 2009, I also would have gone to the Colton Elementary School had it not been sold and turned into a yeshiva school. I have 12 family members that have gone and are currently attending the public schools in our district. During my time as a student, most notably in Ramapo High School, my fellow students and I were surrounded by leaky ceilings and mold in every part of the building. It eventually got to the point where falling ceiling tiles became a daily occurrence. Then one day, while I was in high school, all of a sudden, we were told that we would no longer be allowed to drink from the, from the water fountains. This was due to the discovery of lead in our water systems. I had learned that I had been drinking poison the same problem remains to this day. Now, 
I have family members in the elementary, middle school, and high school levels that are experiencing the same problems that I did all those years ago. For years, the white majority school board has failed us students of color, and there are still no signs of change. Now I'm hearing that banks aren't willing to lend money to the district, and I can't say that I'm surprised given the blatant mismanagement of funds when it is, the, is in the hands of this white majority school board that is supposed to be helping students of color. Enough is enough, and we as a community have demands. Number one, appointing a representative board of education. The New York State Commissioner of Education must be empowered to replace the existing school board with a board that represents public school families and has strong safeguards to prevent conflicts of interest. Number two, restoring building conditions. The new board must develop a plan to fully repair and improve all school buildings. These improvements must be tackled as soon as possible and in order of seriousness. The funding will come from a combination of local bonds and increased state building aid and must happen without the need for voter approval. In conclusion, this school board has failed students of color for generations. They refuse to pass a budget that cuts luxury transportation costs for private religious schools. And I want to clarify that this white majority school board is holding the education of colored students hostage, and that has to end now. Community members, if you would like to help us with this mission, go to Ignacio and sign your name. Padres que nos quieren ayudar con nuestra misión, buscan a Ignacio y firmen su nombre. Gracias. Speaker number nine, so I'm sorry, speaker number eight. Yeah. En primer lugar, um, quiero dar las gracias a toda la comunidad que se presentó el día 24 de las semanas dos pasadas, a toda la comunidad que estuvo presente, a todas las madres que hicieron un harto trabajo para unir a la comunidad y ser más fuertes. Quiero agradecerles desde mi profundo agradecimiento, ya que muchas de ellas están aquí, a todas las organizaciones que se hicieron presente con su apoyo, muchas gracias, les agradecemos. Estamos aquí por una causa y no es necesario que siempre sea lo mismo. Quiero agradecer a todas las personas que de una, de una u otra manera quieren cambiar el distrito, simplemente no es suficiente. Asimismo, tuvimos eh, el anuncio hoy en la mañana que estaría una, la comisionada Betty aquí, Eh, lastimosamente ella no estuvo aquí para escucharnos, era importante, era vital que ella se quedara y no simplemente se quedaran las personas que la representan a ella, era importante que ella se quedara para que escuchara lo que está pasando en el distrito. Necesitamos mar, más maestros, vengo a ser la voz de esos maestros, necesitan firmarse esos contratos Muchas veces he ido a la, a la escuela donde va mi hija a tener mis reuniones como PTA, soy la presidenta de PTA de Margaret. Y de las dos ocasiones que me he sentado en esas mesas, de lo sucias que están, mi ropa ha salido sucia. He hablado con las profesoras y me dicen que simplemente no hay solución porque eso no se sabe si está en el contrato, limpiar unas mesas, unas simples mesas. Eso es ridículo. Debería darnos vergüenza que unos niños estén comiendo en unas mesas que están de lo más sucias. Y podría continuar con muchas cosas. Pero de la misma manera quiero que cambien las políticas. Necesitamos nuevas leyes. Queremos nuevos cambios. Estamos listos para pelear. No vamos a aceptar una cosa menos de lo que nuestros hijos se merezcan. Soy esa madre latina que está peleando por sus hijos. Es suficiente. Hemos tenido esto suficiente por más de 10 años. 
Queremos cambios y los queremos ahora. De la misma manera, sé que hay autoridades importantes en esta reunión y para ustedes es mi voz de esta noche. Necesitamos nuevas Betis, no queremos. Si es que ella no ha estado haciendo su trabajo, la queremos fuera. Ella ha tenido la oportunidad de hacerlo, ¿por qué no lo ha hecho en todos estos años? Queremos otra gente nueva. Estamos cansados de la misma gente. Queremos gente nueva. Así es que si ella se tiene que ir y está en sus manos, está en el poder, ustedes tienen el poder para sacarla, sáquenla. Toda la gente que no está aportando a ese distrito, que solamente está cada vez llevándonos a la ruina. Hay, hay gente poderosa, hay niños brillantes. Nosotros tenemos niños exitosos. Aquí están nuevos jueces, aquí están nuevos deportistas. Hay gente, tenemos talento, Isra Mapo tiene talento. Simplemente no tenemos la gente adecuada lidiando con, estas, con esta crisis que tenemos en este distrito. No queremos escuchar que no tenemos dinero. Ustedes debieron saber que si ya se estaban yendo para allá, ¿por qué no lo detuvieron? Queremos nueva gente y queremos que toda la gente que no ha estado funcionando, que se vaya, no lo necesitamos. Gracias. Thank you. Speaker number nine. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our community, the people who are sitting in the back, they are the Mrs. Betty Rosa delegates. Please, because a lot of you guys, they don't know who is the delegate. So. She, they are, the people who are sitting in the back, they are delegates from the uh, Commission of Education. So I'll let you know, guys. If they can in I, para que les conozco. And this message is going for, this message is going for our Commissioner, Betty Rosa. She was here when our meeting six years ago. She promised justice. R remember, justice. And, uh, Too many years later, we don't got nothing. And even today, I know she was here. But let's what? We understand she don't care about our district. And I want to give us a message. She, she lives here about 25 minutes away. We respect too many of every people. Every people deserve respect. But also, you have to understand, our community is a majority and our no voice. Why? Because we can vote. There's a fortune in Only people, only a citizen people available to vote in local district. But you guys very smart uh, delegates. In New York City, every people who live in New York, even they available to vote for mayor. So what about here? Look like, uh, guys, you put those wrong white people in our district. They don't deserve to be here to destroy our community. They, in their mind, is only to destroy. <laughs> Tell her, Mrs. Betty Rosa, and we know where she live. We're gonna go to her house, she live in Tapan. We're gonna go to her house every Sunday morning, seven o'clock in the morning. I know they're gonna wait, the state police, the state detectives, they're saying, like all these guys put me, a lot of times try to put me in the jail. But I don't afraid, because you know guys, why? Because we're fighting for our rights, with capital word, rights. And you guys make a mistake, they put wrong people, even they don't know What I mean, the word education, that's the reason how they, they destroy our innocent children. And not only that, Mr. Mrs. Betty Rosa, she is accomplished, accomplice, a witness the, of criminal or education. Because remember, guys, to, to discriminate, to destroy our innocent wings, this is to be criminal. One single human being, but it's every single year over 10,000 innocent children, future for this country, who destroy the white people, the outsiders coming to our district, even they don't have a, a single children in our district. Not only that, I'm gonna go a little more. I not have, have nothing personal with our, our Dr. Ellis. He has two kids in the, in the city, but he don't live here. He live in the city. If he thinks this is the best, the best district, why he don't bring a headache children to, to learn here? 
How you guys, delegates of the education on, of New York, how you guys feel our district is the worst in, the, in New York, is the worst in the United States, and probably is 10 decades back in South America education. Believe it. So how you guys, you want to be feeling in here, and those outsiders come to destroy our schools? How you guys feeling? How? Tell them to Betty Rosa, instead of to have our little schools what we have here, in the next 20 years, we have to build here a juvenile jails. Because remember, for next year, we have no budget. The budget will be no. So we have no money. Nobody, any banks want to give us money a, a, anymore. You know why? Because those people who are sitting in here, they destroy everything. I also want to be in clear and not angry. This is the way how I talk. I like to talk. Whatever is wine is wine. Whatever is bread is bread. This is my, my, my way how I talk. So please, delegates from the state of New York, where is the justice? Thank you. Where is Mr. Rosa? What she was doing? Speaker she now respects us because look, she lived 25 minutes away and she's in Tapanga. She's not here today. Thank you. But Thank you. Speaker number 10, please. Good afternoon. I am a parent of a ninth grader. And I see Kathy, that you want to set the timer? Turn the mic back on, please. Turn the mic on. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm a parent of a ninth grader. And he goes to East Ramapo School, and every day he goes to school, it seems like he's not learning nothing. There's not enough teachers up in there. There's not enough schools for these kids. All these kids are in two schools cramped up. It doesn't make any sense. All these schools that they're building is not for the, kid, for, for, the public, for the public. It's only for the private. It's not fair. How are these kids supposed to learn if they all cramped up in one school and no teachers? It doesn't make any sense. Why are they taking all the schools away? There's no budget, like they said, there's no budget because the budget or the money they're supposed to be getting is going to these private schools. And why do they need all these private schools for? What about these kids for the public schools? It doesn't make any sense. And also, my son goes to school to learn. And like I said, he's not really learning anything. He's coming home and he's also telling me about he's being called names. And it really hurts me because he shouldn't have to go to school. Mm. He shouldn't have to go to school being called out his name. That he's too dark, he's a monkey, and he's a cucaracha. That's not right, that's not cool. And I got to hear this from my child. So he really don't want to go to school. He doesn't want to take the bus. He asks me every day, could he stay home? So what's the purpose of him going to school? Because he's not learning nothing. There's no school for these kids anymore, no schools. Because everything is being taken away, and it's not fair at all. Not fair. The same way they make it, building these schools up for these other kids, they should be able to build it for these kids too. They need something better and bigger and more help. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Speaker number 11. Speaker number 11, Helido Fernandez. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Mérida, soy madre de familia de, de una niña de la escuela eh, Marger. A mí me da de verdad mucha tristeza porque mi hija de, y, los, y los compañeros de ella están desde que comenzó el año hasta ahora sin una maestra estable. Mi niña no aprende casi nada, como dice va a la escuela a veces por ir, porque regresa y cada vez maestros diferentes. 
quisiera que por favor nos ayuden a establecer maestras que estén constantes para que nuestros niños tengan un aprendizaje bueno y puedan seguir con una buena educación o si no, creo que es muy difícil para ellas ir y no aprender casi nada. Eso es todo lo que puedo decir. Gracias. Thank you. Speaker number 12. Buenas noches con todos. Buenas noches aquí autoridades aquí presentes. Eh, mi pregunta es para ustedes, que ¿qué pasó con las cámaras en los buses? Literal, hay un niño que rodaba en las, en las redes sociales que le estaba ahorcando a otro niño. Y no sé qué pasó, si ese es un programa gratis, supuestamente, que ya era para estar instaladas las cámaras en los buses y no hemos tenido respuesta a todo eso. Quisiera que ustedes nos den una respuesta, ¿qué es lo que está pasando? Nosotros necesitamos, nuestros niños necesitan estar seguros, pero es algo que no, ni en el BAS, ahora ni en las escuelas están seguros los niños. Porque acaban de decir, otra madre, que igual el bullying, existe demasiado bullying, es algo que no hacen nada en las escuelas. Es algo que no han trabajado para que nuestros hijos estén seguros, y es algo que necesitamos y yo pienso que aquí muchos de los padres que están aquí también necesitan una respuesta a eso, pero ustedes no nos han dado, porque ahora yo quiero dejarles saber que ahora hay más padres unidos y vamos a luchar por esta causa, porque esta causa es de todos, hoy no se va a diferenciar, no se va a quedar así, como los, antes los padres nunca ellos hablaban, decían nada porque ellos no saben en realidad la situación de Irama, porque cada vez empeora, hay más, incluso no hay maestros, ¿qué pasó con los contratos? No hay contratos para los maestros, muchos maestros ya están postulados para otras escuelas, porque ya no hay presupuesto. Es algo que deben ustedes respondernos como autoridades, como usted, en ustedes está hacer eso, el poder está en ustedes, en sus manos, pero ustedes no lo han hecho simplemente porque, disculpen, no les da la gana de hacer. Tal vez porque nos ven a nosotros los hispanos, dicen que a ustedes no les importa, como dijeron una vez aquí, si a ustedes que son padres no les importa, peor a nosotros. Pero no, hoy hay una comunidad que se levanta y vamos a luchar. Yo quiero que ustedes sepan que todos los que están aquí van a estar siempre, porque hoy nos levantamos para que nuestra voz sea escuchada y si tenemos que llegar a la, más alto, a lo donde que tengamos que llegar para que esto funcione y sea un cambio, vamos a lograrlo. Gracias. Thank you. Speaker number 13. Good evening, board members. Good evening, New York delegates. Y buenas noches a todos. Good evening to everyone here. <coughs> to begin with, I am an alumni of East Rample Central School District. With my hard work and effort that I could do in this district, I'm in college studying law. You know how many people want to study law here? For this same reason, I am here to advocate for all these people that you guys don't like to listen to at all. Guys, I'm actually talking to every single one of you right now. Every single one of you have a responsibility for our rights, our children, their children, the new generation. Hear it. Don't just let what I'm saying come in from one ear and get out the other. Like my mom says, no dejes que una cosa te salga por la otra oreja. You guys, better give us our education that we need here as a new generation. I am so tired. I worked so hard to get out of this district 
because you guys didn't give me what I deserved. I never got what I deserved in this district. And apart from that, there were so many discriminations going on in this school district. It is unbelievable. How can you guys look at me in the face? How can every single one of you look at me in the face and tell me you don't feel ashamed of yourselves? Please, how our children, our undocumented children, because you know damn well that our children are here, they're new children, that they will become something greater in their life if our education was given the right way. There is no way that I had to basically crawl myself out of this district to able to be studying law. And I want them to know that no están solos, porque hay niños que sí hacen caso y sí quieren una voz para ustedes y los niños que no, no están solos. You guys are not alone. Believe me, you're not alone. And there's more children, like the kids right here, they want change, we want change. There is no more private schools, there is no more just white people controlling us. They don't, you guys, don't go inside our schools, do you? You guys don't look at us, do you? You guys don't see what we're eating, what they were eating, what I was eating. You guys don't know what it was studying in those classrooms. Keep in mind, our children are a priority. We're not animals that can be sold out of a budget. Hear me right, I will be here every single meeting. You will know my face and you will know my name. That's all I have to say. Todos se pueden unidos. Tenemos que estar unidos. Thank you. That concludes public speaking. We will now move on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Ellis. Thank you, and I'd like to thank, particularly like our, our uh, congratulate and highlight our students who spoke tonight. You spoke well, and I'm proud of you guys. Thank you for that. So welcome, everybody, to our March 5th uh, Board of Education uh, meeting. My name is Dr. Clarence Ellis. I'm the superintendent of the East Rampo Central School District. Um, tonight is going to be a budget development work session, so uh, that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So just to highlight a timeline of what's going to take place and how we're going to address the needs uh, that will be announced and uh, broadcast by way of this upcoming budget. So on February 15th, we discussed, we shared information about the fiscal status, about our financial status, about our cash flow, about our budget and our budget deficiency. Tonight, that's the, the day, three, March 5th, um, the board has to make decisions to balance the budget. Decisions must be reflected in the budget and they have to be sent to the New York State Education Department monitors and Commissioner Rosa by the 7th, March 7th, the day after tomorrow. On March 19th, our next board meeting will present results of the board decisions. We'll discuss with the latest uh, date for the board to, to approve the, the board propositions, transportation, transportation referendum, and the other options that we have highlighted. On April 2nd, we're going to have additional budget discussions. And as a note, there's an anticipated adoption of a New York State legislative budget as well. So that will have a huge impact on the, where our budget stands at that point. April 16th, the board adopts the budget. So now, tonight, I want to discuss the highlights of tonight, what we, attempt, what we hope to accomplish. Number one, we have a, a rhetorical question we always ask ourselves is is it good for kids is it good for kids so that's number one that should be first and foremost on our mind is this good for our children next the board of education will review and respond to the superintendent myself and my team's budget recommendations that is the goal for tonight so as we start all of our meetings as one of our young men stated earlier he talked about this um, we, we start our meetings with our mission, our vision statement. Our mission acts as the, as the why and the who we are by explaining our fundamental purpose as an organization and what our goal is to support our children. As a unified district and a unified community, the East Rapport Central School District is committed 
to educating the whole child by providing a healthy, safe, supportive, engaging, and challenging learning environment, our vision. Vision captures the what or who we hope to become in our desired future and what we want for our children. We'll become proficient in all that we do. So now, again, the budget decision-making framework. The bottom of this slide is just information. Normally, we throw percentages, but I think sometimes when, when we show percentages, people think, oh, it's like a bank statement, and you forget there's people behind it. So we wanted to show sheer numbers. So while I'm going through the, the priority statements, look at the bottom of the actual students we serve. So our first priority, we want to prioritize students and student learning. We want to remain aligned to the East Rapids Central School District's long-term district strategic and academic plan, our mission, our vision, our listed priorities, our core beliefs, and our critical role in the community. We want to maintain equitable access to quality public education for all of our students, for all of our students. We want to prioritize equity, diversity, and inclusion in discussions and when building consensus. Consensus doesn't always mean everybody's happy. It's what we all can live with. That's what consensus means. What can we live with? And next, protect East Rampo's strength and long-term viability to establish fiscal solvency. We, it's within our hands to handle this. It is within our hands. Next, comply with federal and state mandates. Of course, we always do. And then finally, to fulfill contractual obligations. Quick look at the bottom, the, the numbers, the, stu the actual numbers of students we serve. 24, 25 budget recommendations. Again, always think in mind, is it good for our kids? We want to maintain, we want, also we want to attract, we want to maintain, and we want to train hired classroom teachers. We want to maintain art and our music program as evidenced by our, our students, how they perform today. Excellence in any domain is transferable to the classroom, that's our belief. We want to maintain high school athletic programs. A fit body makes a fit mind. You can't have one without the other. We want to maintain social emotional supports, our social workers, our guidance, the NICE team, MTSS, all of the programs and the initiative that we set forth to support our kids, particularly after coming out of the pandemic. And that left a lot of our children with many needs as well as our adults. And we want to hire transportation, FTEs, meaning full-time employees. We're short in our transportation department. We want to do better. We want, to, we want to improve the quality of customer service, but you need resources to do that. You need funding in order to have the, 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 the staff members. Whether it's classroom or in transportation, the, the funding is necessary. Next slide. Dr. Wahab. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. So today we are going through a work session and we just want to set the stage of the purpose, people, process, and what the end product for today will be. So the purpose, we um, are having the board members respond to the superintendent's budget recommendations. Uh, the board members are those people who will be involved in this work session. The process, three steps, similar to last year, but slightly different, um, as the product has to be completed by tomorrow. So for the first step, the board is going to review through these slides the budget recommendation. They'll reflect. You can ask clarifying questions. Step two, just discussing any recommendations you'd like to um, understand further. Step three, the board members would submit responses uh, to each recommendation item. You should have received um, a document. So you res uh, respond to each recommendation item uh, to the district clerk by tomorrow. Um, and just to ensure efficiency and ad adhere to the timelines we have, we have strict timelines at this point. Any omission, just to note, any omission of a yes or no response will be an assumption that there's agreement to the recommendations presented. And finally, um, tomorrow the district clerk will tally. Please proceed. Proceed. Um, finally, the district clerk will tally the board members' responses to the superintendent's board recommendations to inform. One moment. I would like to remind everyone we're in the middle of a public meeting to try to keep it down so we can continue doing business. Thank you. Dr. Iwaha. So that the public understands, today's um, work session's goal is to look through all the recommendations of the budget. 
So by the end of this work session, the board will tally, uh, the district clerk will tally the board's recommendations that will inform the budget that will be sent to the monitors. Should I continue or wait? Please continue. Okay. Uh, sent to the monitors for Thursday, uh, March 7th, 2024, and that would be submitted to the commissioner. Are there any questions on what we're doing? Um, my, my only concern is um, us being told tonight that we're being asked to um, submit responses to recommendations by tomorrow, knowing that uh, we have to submit a proposed budget to the commissioner by March 7th. How is that giving us enough time to review, look at, submit responses for your team to go through each board member's response to come up, I guess, with a finalized budget to then submit by the 7th. I mean, because aside from this, we also work. So, and you know, we have other activities or kids at home too, so I don't think it's fair to share with this with us tonight and expect something to be done by tomorrow, knowing that prior to tonight, we had a strict timeline that's been shared at previous board meetings. Right. I do believe that the board has received each of these recommendations prior to this meeting. So all of the recommendations have been shared of the levels, the green, yellow, red levels. So all of those have been shared with the board previously. For this public session, our hope was to utilize this time. Uh, we understand that there are certain time constraints today. So we wanted to acknowledge that and allow for additional time tomorrow. So the only thing I'm saying is, so you're referring to what we shared the past, I guess last, what we started last week. What I'm saying is, I just wish that we knew this was coming and it was part of the conversation when we met um, to go over the recommendation for the budget. That way it's, it wasn't, you know, it's not something that we're learning tonight that we have to, right. you know. So Vice, this, Pres Vice President Charles Pierre, if I may, um, I do understand, I don't disagree with you, I do not disagree with you. However, um, we had to be very sober and we had to really, really take our time and dig in to even come up with these options. It was painstaking and very, very uncomfortable because even though there's a need for streamlining, I don't even like to use the word cuts, but let's face it, for cuts, we're having, we have increased enrollment. So that's why it was, it, took, it was such a delicate thing and took so long. It wasn't done intentionally to jam anybody up this evening or anything like that. You, you know how difficult it was. No, I, well, no, at least all, I hope you do. No, I understand that. All I'm saying is that it would have been nice if we were informed that this would have been part of the process ahead of time. I'm not saying that, you know, um, it's, it's just the timing is what I'm talking about. And that the fact that we're being informed now that there's another part to this process that was started last week where we're expected to submit responses. And like I said, um, being able to go over whatever was talked about last week, because I do know it's two separate sessions, um, you know, just being able to have a chance to digest and hear what everyone had to say, and then being able to look at the final and submitting our responses so that you guys can do your tally and finalize is, is, is basically what I'm saying. Good evening. So I'll go over um, this, the same, mostly the same information that was um, presented at the last board meeting. Um, the preliminary budget estimates um, came to approximately $336 million in expenditures um, with estimated revenues at $316.8 million. Um, so we see that's definitely a deficiency in the budget. Um, of approximately 19.3 million. So what is included in our estimated expenditures? Um, our estimated expenditures take into account increases for necessary FTEs, um, the related benefits. They take into account our projected expenditures in transportation as um, a factor of increased enrollment as well as pricing um, that can happen up 
in, in accord with a competitive bidding as well as CPI increases. Um, we also know that the change in the estimated budget is approximately 40 million. Um, what accounts for this change? We know that back in 2021, we faced a deficit of over 20 million in our budget. Um, but since then, we've had federal stimulus funding as a result of COVID, um, where we were able to code a lot of the FTE needs into those federal grants. Um, additionally, we know that the state provided an increase in foundation aid um, this current year. Um, so during the past few years, we weren't able to, we, we didn't have to realize the expenses in our um, A fund and our general budget that's supported by um, the state aid and tax levy. So what is estimated in revenue? Right now, our current estimates take into account a tax levy at the tax cap of 5.38%, which is an increase of approximately $8 million. Um, the total tax levy that is reflected here is approximately $162 million. Um, right now, the legislative state aid runs indicated a ta uh, state aid of approximately 149 million, and then there's other estimated revenue that accounts for revenue, um, other claims, and rental um, fees, and other um, revenue items that we have within our budget. And again, our deficit is 19.3 million as we develop the budget. So I'll, I'll um, some of my team mem members will go over some of the items that we were able to categorize as options and recommendations to the board. Thank you. I'm sorry. Are you now. able to zoom in on that screen? Can you zoom in? Thank you, Ms. Espinel. <clears throat> so as you summarized, uh, with those calculations, we have a $19 million shortfall. What the question that we had to ask ourselves is that assuming that the budget passes at a 5.38% tax cap, what options do we have to balance the estimated budget? Right? So we divided this into two parts. One is a, re is a reduction in expenditures, and the second is an increase in revenue and the use of revenue and savings. So on this chart, multicolored chart, you see four different colors. I'll review the first one here. This is what we call level one. And these uh, possible expenditure reductions are the ones that we felt are the furthest away from the classroom. This is where we started, right? So as Dr. Ellis um, said a few minutes ago, we did everything that we could and were successful in not cutting teaching staff. Uh, there are many, many things that we maintained but some things we had to cut to, um, to balance this budget uh, to start anyway. So among these is a freeze in some new hires. So the first thing that you see is uh, school security aides, school custodians, and ground workers. Um, we are eliminating um, a um, uh, funding line that we had for the superintendent's uh, suspension hearing officer a stipend for uh, contracted service. And we're reducing building maintenance equipment. Um, the um, reductions will limit preventative maintenance that are ne that's necessary for all district and school buildings. But we felt that these were the furthest from the classroom, so we started there. In addition to the level one, um, we also had to keep discussing the impact, uh, the direct impact on students, and we identified um, some level two options as well. Um, for the purposes of tonight's meeting, um, I will be discussing the restructuring of existing special education models in anticipation of shifts, shifts to least restrictive environments across all of our specialized programs. Um, this will lead to a reduction in ancillary services However, we must keep in mind, pending any increases in IEP mandates, this may lead us to being non-compliant. The 
The next set of reductions have a high impact on students. Although they will yield a $1.4 million plus, we need to bear in mind that it is not good for children, but we are trying to ensure that we have reductions. Eliminate co-curricular after school activities for middle school. This can impact our students' college and career opportunities. During the middle school year, students, that's when students develop their talent and their skill and hopefully make them very competitive by, um, before they get to high school and be able to play varsity level and make them attractive to colleges. We're going uh, also looking at reducing co-curricular after school activities for the high school, clinical services, and phys ed and health materials and supplies. This will have a significant impact again. Dr. West, uh, I'll jump in on this one. Um, so as a result, I mean, you just covered the, the, the red, right? So this next piece, um, possible revenue increase. I don't want the community to think that there's another, another revenue source, because there isn't right now. This was just our strategy for us to augment our, our shortfall. And that was for us to use our unassigned reserves. So reserves for a school district, it's analogous with savings for an individual, right? When you have a savings account, we have reserves. So the only way we can meet our obligations on top of passing a budget, we're still going to have close to a $19.3 million, $19 million deficit. The way we're going to make up that difference is to use our unassigned reserves. So what that will mean is there's going to be an increased need but a, de a decreased ability to borrow. So reserves are necessary even for a, a, a district that's very financially stable, even districts that are really in a solid place financially, they all need to borrow because of the time period between the end of the summer, let's say August, school tax bill, if you notice on your, your property tax bill, the school taxes are, are taken in November. So the school tax money isn't transferred to the schools by way of property taxes till November. So from August to around November, you have to borrow. That's called a bridge loan, just to meet obligations. That's not because you're financially you know, uh, insolvent at that point in time. All districts have to do this. But if we, if we use our reserves to augment the shortfall, we're gonna, it's going to cause a problem with borrowing. We tried to go out and borrow a few months ago for our energy performance contract. Uh, we shared this with the community. We have very high utility bills almost every month in some of our buildings. Just imagine, you know what your bills are like in your own homes. Imagine a school building, five, 600 kids, 100 staff members. So we were trying to um, update our furnaces, our lighting systems, what have you, where the savings would go back to the district. But in order to make that happen, we needed to borrow money to buy the new boilers, to buy the new lighting system. We put an RFP out. That stands for a Request for Proposal. Normally, banks would line up, but because we constantly have a fail budget or zero approved budget, each time that happened, our Moody's rating decreased, it got lower, it got worse. So then no one came out for the RFP, we couldn't borrow. That's, so that was just the beginning. That was like letting us know we're down, we're ready for the, we're going down the road to perdition. Next is there'll be, if we do borrow, if we can borrow, if there's gonna be extremely high interest rates. So that, those that money we pay in excess interest could be going to our students. It jeopardizes, I mentioned, our credit score. It limits our ability to access grants. You say, well, how would that impact a grant, you say? Let's just say, for argument's sake, we get a $50 million federal grant. They don't just give us $50 million. Most of those grants are what you call reimbursable. You have to start spending money first. You have to jumpstart the, sp jump the spending, and then the cycle starts. But if you don't have any money to jump to start the spending, if we use our reserves up, we won't be able to do the jumpstart spending. Therefore, it'll impact our, grant, our, our ability to receive grants. There'll be less cash on hand for emergencies or unexpected expenses. As you know, most of the buildings in this district were built around the same time period. And, and because of lack of repair and upkeep, they're breaking down around the same time. Um, within my first two months here, 
uh, around uh, two, three months in by October 2021, we had to shut down Spring Valley for two months because uh, on top of asbest uh, asbestos abatement, which was we were going to schedule further down in the summer, we uncovered mold. So we figured we had to close. We went to virtual instruction for two months. That was an unexpected expense of $4 million. Last year, we had an issue at Lime Kiln, which dealt with electricity, unexpected expense. Um, last summer, um, last fall, somebody ran their car. They lost control of their car. They were practicing driving in one of our parking lots, and they ran into one of our doorways. Who expected that, right? But all to repair it, all of it takes funding. So that's what happens if we go into reserves. It is definitely not a preference. Next slide. I'm sorry. Before you move on, I have a sure. few questions. Sure. Can you go into more details when you, about when you say um, reduction in building maintenance equipment budget? Um, school supplies and materials and physical education and health materials and supplies, what does that look like? Like, what are the specifics? So on building uh, equipment budget, I had originally, originally in my estimates factored in some equipment because we do have ARPA funding and we do have an equipment line for that, but there are certain items that we have to get permission from SED to cover. Um, for example, vehicles, vehicles to transport um, tools back and forth to different um, buildings for the mechanics to be able to take care of preventive um, maintenance I, uh, jobs that they have. The vehicles are incurring a lot of um, ma mechanic ma maintenance expenses, so we wanted to be able to purchase more newer vehicles so I, I factored in an amount to purchase new vehicles just in case we're not able to get those through any other funding source. So that was on the, on the equipment. Um, what were the other items you wanted School more? supplies and materials. So school supplies and materials. Um, Jessica, I believe those were related to um, some items that we can potentially seek other funding for, but when it comes to materials, we can yes. try our best to streamline. But what kind of materials are we referring so to? Is it paper, is it ink? Right, so I'm going to have, you have it. Dr. West? Thank you. So it's basically we're going to reduce inst uh, the instructional materials, so What's going to happen is that um, we're going to look at areas where we will not purchase materials for the programs, the physical health, um, PE, health. So for example, replacing minimal supplies like yeah. not the balls or not anything that's required for the curriculum, but we're trying to go out and secure new curriculum, new materials that go along with curriculum to ensure that our health program is one that's stellar. And right now we can't, we have to put a pause on that because there's just not enough money left over for us to do that. Dr. Iwaha, you wanna add? Sure, so each school building has a, a budget and there's also a district budget. So we're not looking to, we had to find ways to reduce, right? To provide options. So each has um, a budget and we're looking at reducing the budget, not eliminating it, so that we get the at least the minimum that is needed, but um, some of our wants won't be addressed. The positive of this particular year and the last two years is that through ARPA funding, we were able to purchase things and kind of invest in the future. However, we can, by limiting it this year, and if we limit it and continuously in other years, it's gonna, it's going to have an impact. So we were blessed with ARPA funding that is helping us. We, we uh, prepared for the possibility, which is allowing us to do this reduction without eliminating, but it's going to be a burden after this year. Have but, we looked into um, instructional curriculum? I don't know if we do hard copy or digital, but have we looked into digital to see if it would be more cost effective where it's not hurting us, but we can still... Um, provide the best instructional um, <coughs> curriculums to our students? Right, so with the physical education uh, materials and supplies, those are more, um, um, 
I'm sorry, I'm not a phys ed, I apologize. Um, more like um, nets and um, things of that nature in terms of the, in the teacher instructional materials, we're, take, we're taking care of that through ARPA. Okay, and so yeah. now. Because the materials and supplies line is different from like textbooks and workbook line. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about um, going into specifics when it go, comes to um, elimination of co-curricular after-school activities? Um, athletics, does that include every single athletic sport in the middle school? Also, same question for the high school. Um, and the, the, the next part to that is I know we have a lot of grant-funded um, after-school programs, which I believe include Liberty Partnerships Program, Well Car, Rising Star, um, mm -hmm the MBK, I believe, mm -hmm. is that gonna be impacted in this as well? And what about transportation? Will transportation okay. still be provided for okay. students after so, school? Okay, so, so can, can I, I speak I, first about uh -huh. the co-curricular? Because you asked about co-curricular first, right? Yes. Okay, so with the co-curricular activities, yes. Um, this, this is not what we desire in terms of middle school, but looking at co-curricular, a typical, um, option is to eliminate all curricular activities because they're not required. Um, what we, the option that we had major discussion around is um, do we eliminate all co-curricular um, because it is not required or do we present an option of um, addressing uh, our high school students who require it, like the young man who spoke before, the after school um, activities are really important to build a student's portfolio. So this is an option that we put forth. So the answer is yes. In terms of middle school co-curricular activities, we're looking at um, eliminating that as part of the option. But I guess my question is, does that also include those um after school programs that I mentioned, which I believe oh, are grant funded. I will no, that's separate. Or is it only what's uh, included in the budget? It's the general fund general budget. Fund. So, so no. it's a two-parter. So programs such as, um, not this, I'm just giving you an example because I don't have the whole list in my head. Ski club, if it is under enrolled, we will not support that. That's an activity, a co-curricular activity that will have to be cut. Um, I, um, there was a, a, a club called Circle of Friends. We're going to look at the enrollment, look at the data for it. That could be cut. So there's some programs, some co-curricular programs that we pay the advisors, materials to support it after school that, won't, that would be eliminated. Or reduced. So does now, that Now, in terms of your LP, Liberty Partnerships, my brother's keeper, Liberty Partnership is an articulation agreement between East Ramapo and Rockland Community College. Rockland Community College has the grant. It's their grant to service our middle schools and our high school students. So those programs will not be cut. My brother's keeper, it's a grant for the fellows. That will not be cut. So anything that has a grant attached to it, unless the grant is taken away, we will not be cutting those programs. And transportation will still be provided at, the both, at both middle and um, high school for whatever activities we do provide. It might mean a reduction of the number of buses because if you don't. Well, it, correct, correct. Right, if now, we have 20 buses right now for after school, and we're cutting and we only need 10, then we may only have 10 buses. Okay, and what about marching band? Because I also know that's an after school program or after school activity. That's not on there. Marching band we did not include in, in this cut. It's not included? Not included. You know, I think it's, <clears throat> it would have been wise or it, I think it's very important that too bad we didn't get an actual breakdown of what actual co-curricular after-school activities were included in each part, whether it be athletic for middle school, high school, because you did come up with a number. So that number is based on exactly what. You get what I'm saying? Because I think that would have been um, beneficial for the board to see exactly what core curricular activities or after-school 
um, activities in the middle school and the high school because that way we would have had a better, um, we could see it better. Because right now we're just, okay, we're asking, okay, what core, core curricular? The Saturday Academy, where does that land? Does the Saturday Academy land anywhere? Because that's considered, I believe, a cool co-curricular yeah. activity after school. Right, and right? I think so. Yeah. I think it should have been really specific in terms of what, what lies underneath each bolt or each topic in regards to the um, level, the red level or level three, if you want to call it, even as well as the other ones. Um, as an educator, you know, I see that we're trying to reduce school supplies and materials, right? As an educator, teachers need resources, supplies, materials in order to do their job. Correct. So that right there kind of confuses me a little bit mm -hmm. because we said what is good for the kids. Mm -hmm. And in order to be a good educator or to be effective, we have to make sure that we have the supplies and materials needed, mm -hmm. right? right, to bring forth the education right. that the right. kids need. So I'm just a little confused with that, that uh, level Trustee, level Trustee McGill, that was a great point. And yeah. again, I'm not going to disagree with anything you said. Mm -hmm. This is not a disagreement. But um, our team mentioned earlier, in anticipation of, um, of this day, we, we, we front-loaded and made a lot of purchases with uh, our, the federal money that we still had at our disposal. We, so we, we bought a lot of materials this year in anticipation of you know, this for next season, for the next school year. Um, of course, teachers will have the, the adequate school supplies. You see, but you see how difficult this thing is. Um, they will have supplies. After, after this upcoming year, the 24-25 year, then it's another discussion, you know? But what we did, we, we front loaded and made as many purchases as we could with supplies in advance. Right. That was something that Dr. Waha and, and, and the entire team did uh, quite well. Dr. West? So for example, when Dr. Waha said Annette, so right now, if there's something that's damaged, we currently have the means to, we're not taking, you know, as a, as a school entity, we have to provide the materials needed to, to um, provide instruction. But in the case of phys ed and health, let's take, for example, the net example that Dr. Iwaha brought up. If there's a net that's damaged, yes, we have some on site right now to replace the damaged net or even a tennis racket. You know, tennis racket, depending on the speed a ball hits it, it could be damaged we may not be able to replace to have those as we go along. Like, we have enough right now on, on hand because we front-loaded the um, purchase through ARPA. The Saturday Academy program, we had to weigh. Saturday is very expensive. It's, um, when I say very expensive, please understand, it's not a Monday through Friday program. So there's additional funds additional fees you have to pay for bringing somebody in on a Saturday. You have to open the buildings. You have to heat the buildings. You have to have a custodian there. You have to have water running. So when we had to make this tough decision, it's not what we want to do. But we still have to find a way to reduce the 19 million shortfill. So it was, do we take away the after school, meaning credit bearing courses that students need to graduate? or do we take away the Saturday? The, a tough decision had to be made, so it's the Saturday. The so, Saturday ended up being more. Yeah, so the sat you're telling me that the Saturday does lie underneath there, uh, that, that, bu that bullet. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> here it is again, um, and I know that we're in a financial crisis, I get it. But then, if you go back to look at our results, you know what I'm saying, for the yep. region's exams. The Saturday Academy was to help those children that are struggling with the region's exams, and they have to take those in June. And you need your region's exams to graduate. Mm -hmm. So have we at least come up with a, uh, do we have it's a different still, option? It's still there if, Monday through Wednesday mm -hmm. for region's review. It just won't be there on Saturday. So what about the credit recovery? One, one, one thing really quickly, I just want to, if you don't mind, uh, Vice President Charles P., I just want to jump on to something that um, Trustee McGill stated. So with the Regents uh, Preparation and Support classes, we work closely with other organizations, strategic partners such as WellCore, who also 
uh, pumps resources uh, into our district. So we can work with them and we have in the past so they can supplement our region's preparation courses through welfare. So this is where we've got to be creative. This is where, you know, your expertise, the expertise of the, of the board comes in handy as well for alternatives. However, we know how important that is. We saw the results. Um, so we're, we're throwing ourselves on the sword in that. We're going to make sure they get the region's preparation they get. As well as I remember last time we spoke, you and I spoke, the SAT preparation, ACT prep as well. And that's something that I've discussed with uh, the uh, owner of, of WellCore, and, and they're all in for supporting us. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, what about the credit recovery uh, program? Because I know at one point we were partnered with BOCES, and we are no longer um, working with BOCES for them to... I guess, um, provide that service to us both at Rampo and Spring Valley High School. Is that part of this reduction or elimination? No. So our partnership with BOCES in the past was for Knight High School, where it really didn't do what our current credit recovery is doing. The Knight High School program, students could only take two academic courses and a PE. That was it, 2.5 credits. The current program we have that's after school, not in this 1.4 plus um, budget, is a hybrid program where we use Edgenuity. It affords the students opportunities to take more than two courses and a gym. It, t it allows us to give students whatever they need in terms of recovering the courses that they need in order to get back on track with their class, to graduate on time. So that is not part it's of not this. included. No. Right. I, I just wanted to add that um, this, these recommendations know, um, are recommendations from the superintendent as options to the board. And um, I think it's so, so beneficial that you are asking these questions because any cuts um, to programming is, it, it's cuts to programming. So that means students aren't getting what we initially um, desired for them to get because the budget was built on the needs of the students, on our population, the unique needs of our population, um, which we believe require more, more than the minimum, more than the standard of comparable school districts. Um, so just know that that's our belief, so that's why we wanted to start off this meeting and wh why we started off with is it good for kids and listed what we um, held as not doing. However, we are tasked um, as a superintendent's cabinet to provide, to support the superintendent in providing recommendations to the board. And these are the recommendations that um, we were able to identify while doing our best to um, keep to those guiding principles. So if we may be transparent here too, yeah. um, what I notice is that what's being presented in front of us doesn't look the same as what it looks like we're going to um, review to uh, provide, to submit our responses to the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why what we're gonna be submitting is not what's on the screen? It is, there is, because when we met last week, Part of the conversation, we took your input. Part of the input was that it was so much, and it, to summarize it. So what this does is, if you notice, each of the items you have listed has a word either eliminate, reduce, or um, or freeze. And if you notice, that's the that's the heading of each of those things listed, and then each of them are summarized underneath it to allow for you to see. We we were hoping that you would see better on the screen. Um, those items, whereas you have it listed in more detail but to what answer I'm some of the questions and provide the implications that you requested. So I understand what you're saying, but why aren't we looking at this on the screen as well? Why aren't we being, why aren't we showing the detailed um, information that's on the sheet so that everyone is aware of what it is that we're going to be responding to to submit to the recommendations? Well, just it's the same thing. We were placed in, based on our meetings last week, we summarized it so that we can have it up here so that it can be visually seen. No, no, I understand that, but yeah. I just feel like for transparency reasons, mm -hmm. if we're going to be transparent and um, as a board be voting, not voting, but responding to your recommendation, that the public should also be aware of what it is that we are looking at 
that is being expected of us to respond to, to submit to the superintendent, if that makes sense. No, it makes absolute sense. I so think even if it was two separate slides where this is the summary and then this is the details so we can all fully understand what's going on, mm -hmm. um, because not only that, too, what I noticed is that some of the stuff that were on this, um, I guess the, the recommendations that were shared with us last week, some of it is different here. Um, I understand that you took everything we said and summarized it, but there's also no explanation to why, I guess, certain things were removed, certain things were added, or, um, you know, there's just, I just want to have a better understanding of, yeah. um, you know, what we're looking at. It's not difficult. We can easily add this to the slide so the public can view it. So that's not a problem. I think that what the task is for today, so there's no, um, there's full transparency, but I think what the task for today, the work session, is um, looking at the superintendent's recommendations and identifying those items that the board, each board member either wants to add as a reduction or not, and then we can do one of two things, either share that or share what the final, um, the final tally is. Which, once so again, I understand, because um, only also going back to how we did it last year, we did it publicly where I think we were asked to do it um, yep. while we were in public session. So I just want to make sure that if, you know, what we did last time, we continue to do it the same way. Also to make sure that everyone else is aware of what we're looking at, because this is different from that. And even though we're going to tally to come up with a final, um, the public won't understand what the final means if they don't know what we're looking at, what right. this looks like. We can take the tallies as we did last year and put you know, how we um, communicated it last year. Uh, last year, if you remember, we had three sessions where we were able to use. This year, we have one session, which is today. So we, um, the team, everyone, we had to figure out a way where we can encapsulate that time and use this time. So, yeah. Well, I, I you know, I'm just looking here. I just want to know exactly what, if something's being eliminated, I want to know exactly what's being eliminated in terms, whether, and like, again, whether it's co-curricular, whether it's athletic, I want to know exactly what it is. I mean, because we, like, again, we've, we've you know, there's numbers here. So it's, it's had to be based on exactly what we're trying to eliminate or reduce. So I think it would be fair um, for, you know, for us to be given that information um, to let us know exactly what it is. Um, I think it's important to do that. I have a quick question. I know the summer programs are covered by ARPA funding for this current summer. Mm -hmm. Is there an option available to reduce that and perhaps repurpose some of that ARPA funding to cover some of these proposed recommendations, um, or is that not a, an option? ARPA. ARPA funding expires in September 2024, so it wouldn't allow us to do that at this time. So will we have summer school for 2024-2025 school year? Yes, for this summer, 2024, no, no. but not 20. No, no, for 2025, the 2024, 2025 school year. Because that's not, summer school is not mentioned here. Right. Summer for school. this year. Yeah, I'm talking about for next school year. Because this is for. This is summer 2024 to um, next year. So from July 2024, this is the budget for July 2024 to June that's 2025. That's right, because it starts July, Correct. July 1st. Thank you. Moving on. Um, so, so we just went over a few categories of um, streamlining um, that amount to four million seven hundred and seventeen thousand dollars. And Dr. Ellis explained a little bit about using um, unassigned reserves to um, close the gap in the budget in the amount of 14.6 million. With that amount, the total comes out to 19.3 million, which um, meets and balances the budget at current estimates. Um, but we know that's also assuming a 
a tax levy passing at 5.38. Shall that not occur and we end up passing or being on a contingency? Uh, one thing I'd just like to add, Ms. Espinel, <coughs> although we're looking for a five point, what's the actual amount, 5.378? 5.38? 5.38. That's the cap. What we would need to make us whole is actually around 17.5% because we've had so many years of either a zero approved or a contingency budget. And when we go zero approved, it's just so we won't have to do, you know, backflip for the most simple transactions. So what we really need, I mean, five, I know the 5.38 looks like a lot, but to, to get us through this year, it would take... 17 and a half percent to really put us in a place where we need to be. So I know the 5.3 sounds like a lot, but really in reality, that's really, it's way less than what we really, really need. Um, so then, so if we don't pass a budget at the cap of 5.38, we face an additional amount of reductions that will equal the amount of the um, tax cap that we're putting forth as an assumption. So that total amount is uh, approximately $8 million. So beyond the $19.3 million that we just addressed with um, streamlining as well as assigning unrestricted fund balance, we'll have to take an additional amount from unrestricted fund balance in the amount of $3.3 million. And we'll still need additional funds. So we'll have to take from restricted reserves um, that were set aside as a result of the last um, fiscal year um, in the amount of 2.1 million from TRS and 2.7 million from ERS reserves to come to the total of 27.6 million. The 27.6 million is the total gap that will be needed to address if um, the budget doesn't pass at the tax levy cap. That would completely empty out reserves? That amount will not completely empty out reserves. Um, that will bring reserves down to approximately 16 million of restricted reserves. So we still have an amount in um, ERS and a few other reserve categories like workers comp. Um, but then I also want to mention that. I'm sorry, was that 16 million or 60? Six, 16, one six. One six. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to mention that the state comptroller's office allows for a district to have at least 4% of reserves of unrestricted funds. And the 4% of the following year budget, which is the estimated budget that we're presenting, 4% um, is 13.4 million. So having only 16 million left comes close to that amount. However, the 16 million that would be remaining, they're all restricted reserves at this time. And you just explain what restricted reserves mean? Right, so restricted reserves are restricted for a specific purpose. Um, we were able to, because of the federal funding, have uh, a surplus in last year's operations. And that resulted in 21.1 million in reserves. Um, they were allocated to ERS, TRS, workers comp, Employee benefit accrued liability and unemployment insurance reserve. So we start depleting those reserves um, to meet the 19. We actually we deplete the unrestricted reserves to meet the 19 million, and then once if we end up on a contingency budget that doesn't pass on the tax cap, we'll end up depleting some of the reserve funds. Um, and I just also want to highlight, and Dr. Ellis went over it a little bit, that having reserves is important for a district to be fiscally solvent, meaning they can, they can meet their long-term obligations. And I think for East Ramapo, that means just meeting the next, possibly just the next year's obligations. Um, also, the impact of um, no local support as far as um, passing 0% increases in the tax levy, um, that has impacted our credit rating. And so those two items coupled together, together are de detrimental to the district. So we're facing the impact of um, the cash deficiency before the budget deficiency. 
Um, I have a question. Have we factored in, I'm just thinking uh, at the prior slide where we mentioned the eliminations, um, for example, um, athletics in the middle school. So ha do we know what this, is the savings factored into this number when it comes to transportation? If we had to reduce transportation due to the reduction or elimination? So right now, no, and we know that transportation is, it's, it's fluid, right? We don't know what's going to happen with the pricing. We don't know what's going to happen with the enrollment. Right now, um, from one year to the next, I have another slide, I, the enrollment increase, our projection is about three to 4,000 on the private side. And then, you know, for public, we always face a few hundred. And that, that is also unknown, right? Because in, um, the enrollment is increasing every year. Um, so I'll go into another slide. I presented it go last time, but I'll, we'll touch upon it. Um, so as I stated, you know, the immediate cash, the immediate concern is on the cash and funding deficiencies. So here our current cash flow states that basically by June we'll be facing a shortage of cash. We wouldn't be able to meet any um, expenditures that are necessary for operations. Um, this result is what East Rampo is facing now, insufficient cash and budget deficiency for the 24-25 school year. Just to put this in perspective, the monthly cost of transportation currently is 6.1 million, and the cost of salary is approximately 11 million per month. Um, So this here shows that um, we've presented many times, there's a slide that's probably very familiar to everyone, um, the impact of lost, the lost revenue that we received, that we weren't able to collect because of um, zero budgets, zero percent increase in the tax levy. But we didn't take into account the impact of passing a budget at the tax cap or an increased rate from year to year. So where that amount, where I've presented previously, amounted to about $30 million over the past few years, this, project, this estimate from the past years of failed budget shows that we have lost to date, to this fiscal year, $77.3 million, .2 million in um, uncollected revenue from failed budgets. Right now, that's from fiscal year 2020, so just, just five years comes to 77.2, and if, if we don't pass the budget this year at the tax levy cap, according to this estimate from prior years, it would amount to 108.5 million. So East Ramapo lost tax levy revenue of over 1 million, potentially, this, it can amount to that this year because the community did not approve an average of 3% in the tax levy increase each, each, each year. I'm sorry, is that as of 2020 or that? From 2020. 100 million? Mm-hmm. That's, that's assuming that we pass a tax cap each of those, that they have, that the tax cap would have passed each of those years. How much would have the increase been every year? So the average tax levy increase would have been 3%. Do you know what our neighboring district's average raise of tax every year is? It varies. Um, I mean, it's always above zero for the I most part. I understand above zero. Between zero and three is a few numbers in between. There are. So I, I've seen, I don't have the data in front of me. I've seen 2%. I've seen greater than 2%. Because this, the scenario you're giving is if we were to raise the taxes every year, by 3% and this year by 5%, mm -hmm. then we would have lost. Now this year, um, not by 5%. This year actually is just, you know, moving the schedule along according to the estimates. The 30 million is a 5%, no? With what no, this, this is accumulate, accumulating each year. If each year passed, the, the calculation is different. It's looking at the past. Right, it's I looking at the past. She, she said 77 is the past, and she assumed 
that the, if, if it doesn't pass this year, it's 30 million. No, um, had this been the scenario from the past to the current? Oh, if we would have had yes. more money, yeah, then it would have been more money to increase, you mean to say. Right, so each instead time, of like paying, a compound, right? Effect. So I, instead of, uh, let's say a house pays now 20,000, if we would have raised every year with the 3%, he right. would have paid 30,000, and the 5% above the 30 would have been another. This is what you're trying to say? This is how it would get to 30 million? Um, can you repeat that one more time? Question was like this. Mm -hmm. If we would have raised the taxes every year with 3%, mm -hmm. then we would have been... That means not the, the tax, the tax the levy. The tax levy, I understand, right. which part, the part that, the, that we pay, not the, what we get from the government. Right. If we would have been able to raise the tax every year, mm -hmm. we would have been up by 77 million. And the rate, if we, let's say someone paid 2020, he paid... $20,000 for his property, mm -hmm. by a 3% raise every year, he would have been up to 25, and with the 5%, he would have been up to 30. Then we would have lost 30 million this year, because what I understood before, the 5% only brings in $8 million. Um, I would have to take more detail to look at the property owner, because this doesn't translate specifically to the tax rate, because we tax three different municipalities. I understand, but... Mm -hmm. um, I took a, I didn't take a specific number. I was just trying mm -hmm. to average where it affects each taxpayer. So if we it would have had a higher tax, we would have paid even higher. It depends because development here, the, the tax rate has decreased over the past. The rate has the, decreased. Actually but during the this period. The rate has decreased, but the value has gone up. So they didn't see a reduction on the payment. But the rate itself. Right. I understand that the rate, but they didn't see any reduction. Right, change in value could have of impacted course, it as the, well. Of course, because the rate, the value went up. Mm -hmm. So even if you pay less for amount per value, you still pay more tax. Right, they're both factors. Qu quick, this doesn't also take into account. We know that the state has significantly underfunded this district for more than a decade. Uh, one of the previous monitors once told me somewhere in the neighborhood of twelve to fifteen million dollars a year. So if you look at the 2020 census, for example, mm -hmm. the average household income in the surrounding districts is over $100,000 a year. Havistra is 85,000, East Rampo is 65,000. Okay. The state funding formula does not reflect the reality of the differences in the districts. So I appreciate what you're saying here, but we have been significantly underfunded for more than a decade, and if you do let's say $12 million, the smallest number over 10 mm -hmm. years, that's $120 million that we lost out over the last 10 years. So you're right about the voters doing this. The state hasn't carried their weight either. And as far as I can tell, the funding formula hasn't changed, and we're still in that pickle, and that's not changing. Right. I mean, this slide is meant to show the impact of the tax levy and, and local support over time, um, but also... We know that in the past couple of years, as the, the gap has widened, we've had federal stimulus funds and we've had um, foundation aid to some level. I'm not saying that the formula is completely correct, but... Right, but the foundation aid that the state has done was to make all these dis districts whole. It still doesn't address the fact, the uniqueness, as Senator Weber put it, the uniqueness of this district and how it's structured where 75% of the kids attend non-public schools. And that, and, and the poverty in this district is not reflected in the funding that we get. So that, that needs to be cured somehow. I, I, that's not something we could do. I'm right. not, I'm I not mean, pretending I, that that mm -hmm. is. But we're, until that gets cured, we will continue to have a problem, regardless of whether budgets pass, don't pass, or whatever. Second to what my colleague is saying is also about the, as it's called over here, homeless. He had before on the slide, we had 1,547 kids that could not provide a living address, so technically they're homeless. We know that most of them are coming out of neighboring districts. They're not from our district. Obviously, East Ramapo does a much better job educating those kids than the neighboring district because otherwise why are they coming here? They would have been, if 
all our surrounding districts would have done a good job educating those kids, not as what we hear every time when some people complain, they wouldn't have come to, to East Rampo. The only reason they're coming to East Rampo, because East Rampo always made the point to educate these kids and try to make them most comfortable what other districts didn't do. And since we have this, this 1,500 kids, if you do a calculation of about 26,000 per kid per year, it's close to $40 million a year that we shell out for those kids, and the state doesn't take anything on it, which I don't, either the neighboring districts or the state, someone should help us with those $40 million that we are a shortfall, besides the fact that these, uh, this amount of kids is more than 70 classrooms, more than 70 teachers, they're English learning teachers, which the state doesn't have enough Spanish certified teachers. This was discussed last time too. Even if we go out to get those teachers, we can't get them because nobody has them. And the neighboring districts, whatever they have, they use for their kids, and the rest kids fall on East Ramapo. And this is also a total unfair burden to our constituents, which I, when they come and ask me, I have no answer for it. Why in the world do they have to pay for close to $40 million for kids? We gladly take them, we try to help them, we help them. No, no kid was ever rejected from East Ramapo to go look shelter in another district, which we know where these kids are coming from. Some are even being bused to us by our transportation. This is something, the SED is over here, and I would address it to them. It makes no sense to me why we have to pay for them. We are here gladly to, even contrary to what we heard tonight, well, a few good things I saw. There was a young lady that's going to be a good lawyer. She sounded very good in her speech. She'll do a good job. And she came out of our district. But the, and the other, it became a white issue, which I don't understand. That's something else. Makes no difference about our color, their color. We, I don't remember ever that we voted down anything that was presented to us because it's a different color, a different ethnic group has nothing to do with that. We, as a group, have an amount of money that we get and an amount of money that we have to spend. That's all that's in our hands when we sit over here. Nothing else has to do with us. We hire an administration, the administration does all the other policies. But when it comes to money, we have a shortfall to what Harry said before. I looked at a district that has about the same kids that us. Buffalo comes up to mind. Buffalo school district's budget is 1.1 billion a year. Their state aid is over $600,000, over, over 600 million. Over 600 million is their state aid. Our state aid is less than, two, than 200 million, it's about 150 for the same amount of kids, whether they are in the system or not. They have 30,000 kids in the public school system. This is what their budget is. If you go that way, our transportation is in line with everybody else. If we would have had a budget for 40,000 kids, not the private, the private sector is actually saving the government over five, over half a billion dollars a year because we are paying our own tuition to our kids. And contrary to what that lady said before that the school district is building buildings for them, every penny they build a building, they pay from their own money above tuition because they can't pay that much, they have to fundraise money. And we saved the state Harry said what we were shortchanged, 12 million. We saved the, the state a lot more money by sending to private schools. And there's no way that the federal, when the federal government looks at an area, if it's, it's a poor neighborhood or not, has nothing to do with where kids go. The SED somehow made that this is the parameter that they're looking for is a school district, if it's rich or not, n not what people make, not what people do. The only thing is where kids go to school. But on kids that don't belong here and we gladly take them and teach them, the kids that live in different districts don't belong in our districts, no. They belong in the districts that they live. Because we do a good job and we educate them and they feel comfortable in our district doesn't mean that they belong in East Rampo's district. They belong in Hevestra, Clarkstown, Orangetown, wherever they live, this is where they belong. I'm and sorry, we pay I'm, so, I'm sorry, what students are you referring to? We I have mean, 1,547 kids that are, re that are called those are called homeless, homeless students, this, Mr. Because Gruber. They cannot, because they cannot provide. Mr. Gruber, that is we not can't what that blame means. children I, for being I'm, poor. I'm not blaming I'm children. Just, well, I don't know. Sorry, Maybe sorry, that's sorry. just what I picked up. If, if you didn't hear me right, I didn't blame children for being poor. I'm, I, I, blamed, I blamed the state system. I blamed the state system 
that has, forces us to shell out money because we do a good job. This is what I blame. What does that mean? What, who, because you also mentioned that why are we paying for them? Who are, when you say them, who what, is them? Where does the 1,540, the number is 1,547 kids that don't have addresses, where do they live? Okay, so do you know what, it means to be homeless. When it says homeless, that can be, the, the, uh, that could be, let me finish, that could be a student, let's say a child, who lives with me, for example, who's not my child, but I provide shelter over there. Okay, so they have an address. These they have an don't address. Have, these these but kids don't have addresses. They do have addresses, but it's defined differently in the state education. And if uh, Mr. Singer or Ms. Jallo can please um, define what homeless means so Mr. Gruber can understand. It's very simple, Sabrina. They're residents of the school district. Why you're classifying a homeless child as a non-resident is simply not true. How and many? As a district, we we are, we and as, as a district, we are obligated they absolutely, to, to. They are residents of East Ramapo. They, because they don't have a roof over their head, doesn't mean Bruce, we could treat them any differently. Bruce, uh, we have asked this question multiple times, and we were answered that a lot of these kids are coming in from neighboring districts. This, this is the and, answer that we and got. Mr. Gruber, we also have, based on that. Wait, wait, let me finish. We also have 2,500 yeshiva kids coming into the district. We don't close our borders to every student. And what do, they pay, what do we pay for those 2,500? Nothing. The busing is 76 million this year. The, 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 this is not from out of the district. Have they're residents. Have, have 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 they're killer. residents, and we treat each child as they have deserve to be treated. To classify home, a child who's homeless as a non-resident, it's irrational. There is so you want us to hire a PI to see where these kids live? Is that what you're saying now? Go yeah. on record and tell me that you're saying that all these there 15 are, there kids are live in East methods. Well, Daniel knows better. I mean, there are methods to, to justify. There are grants on this. The McKenney Vento I understand, grant. I understand that the states makes us, make us take them. We gladly take them. Nobody ever said we shouldn't take them. But someone should help us, the, help us out with the money for that. But I, I, as, as a district, we are obligated to I, educate Every, every child, child as much. Child yes, but I think what state, Mr. Gruber is saying. But the state is obligated to pay for it. Someone should be obligated to pay for it. What do you want us? We should hire a PI and tell each kid where they're being picked up? I haven't seen a shelter in East Ramapo that houses 1,500 kids. Everybody has a roof. They don't live in the street. Mr. Guba, STA, they call STH, Students in Temporary Housing, okay. right? And it's not only the ones that are in family residence, you know, like the family uh, havens. They're also, if you're considered doubled up, that's also considered a student in temporary housing. What and, do you and mean? And it by was a big up, up. Hang on, there was a big uptick across New York State after the financial crisis in 2008. That's when they started um, modifying the definition to include not only children in the family havens, but also the ones where you, you know, may live cousins, may live together, what have you. Those are also considered students in temporary housing. There's a, there's a bit of funding that supports them. Um, and that's called McKinney Vento, um, and that's part of it. There, the definition of the home of McKinney Vento students is uh, these are children who and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. All the students, save for 15, who are homeless in the district, have fallen to that definition. We do have 15 students that have left the district and are in neighboring districts still homeless, either living in a motel or other kind of temporary housing, that we are obliged to bus into our schools. They were students here. They're still homeless in another district. The law says we must bus them back to, um, to our district yeah. schools. Mm -hmm. If they move out of our district into permanent housing, they're no longer homeless. They're no longer residents of our district. We only have 15 students who are- Only 15 mm -hmm. kids that are being- Dr. Shanahan, if there's a homeless child living in Clarkstown, let's say, can that homeless child choose to attend school in East Ramapo? No, only if that child was a, an East Ramapo student, homeless, and moved to Clarkstown and is still homeless there, yes. They can do that for one year, for, till the end of the year. And I think for uh, example purposes, we just had a fire at Sl on Slint Avenue where 100 families were displaced. I believe there were 23 
uh, children that were um, affected, and I think 21 that attend East Ramapo. As of today, majority of them are living in hotels, which may not be in the East Ramapo district, but because they are students of East Correct. Ramapo, we are obligated to transport them to and from wherever they're staying. Correct. I understand that. I understand all of this. We have asked this question multiple times, and the answer was there's a lot of these kids do not live in the district. They only come to the district. They give an address of a temporary residence within the district. We don't have any evidence of that. What? Okay. So, if I, if I may, I asked yes, multiple sir. times what the district is doing to verify that. I know there is... I know there is guidelines from the state what can and cannot be done. Was anything done to verify that? Short of hiring detectives to follow the students, we have family resource coordinators at every one of our buildings who have their finger on the pulse of students' residents. They know the families, they know the conditions of the students, and when there's any kind of change in, from homelessness to permanent housing, whether in the district or not, the family resource coordinators communicate with the homeless liaison here, and we do the, the whatever paperwork it is that we have to do. But the, it's, a, it's in the schools where they know the kids and they know the kids' histories that this knowledge comes from. And I, I also believe there's a policy and process in place where students can't just attend whatever district they want. So for example, if I live in East Rampo and I wanted to send my son to North Rockland, there is a process that they go through and they vet to make sure that I do live in the district of North Rockland before saying, yes, my child can go there. We go through the same process and I think that if there was an issue, um, the state would have raised it by now and you know this wouldn't be a conversation. At the end of the day, we are here to educate all students and I think we should be, our focus should be figuring out how we can help all students that are in our district as opposed to you know saying why are we helping students that shouldn't even be here that was not sorry but that was not my question my only question was why the state does not step in to give us money to help us to do that the, that the was state, my but question. the state has been helping us years after years but not at the amount we, not at the amount that which they would have helped I'm if, sorry? They wouldn't, if they wouldn't have had their calculations, their amount would have been a lot more. Yeah, but if we also would have passed budgets every year, that would have helped too. I mean, yes. we need to and hold as, ourselves as, accountable as, as, as I for what up, we're not doing. As I brought up the last two years, nobody passed the budget. If you go back to your words, your words didn't pass the budget either. It had nothing to I'm do sorry? with the... The, no ward has passed the budget. Exactly, and, and I'm last, talking that, that we not to... I'm not that saying, not, that has I did not say to do your ward. I said we have not passed budgets. We I didn't blamed, say you. We were I didn't blamed say tonight, your ward. We were blamed tonight as an ethnic group as who, didn't, who, who, who didn't pass a budget or who is destroying education and what when, when this is totally false from beginning to end. There's no, nobody over here on this board ever voted no on anything that a student needed. None of us voted no on what a student needed, and we were blamed for this the whole night, that we are voting no, that we are building buildings for private schools, we are doing everything for the private school. The private school also has rights. They get almost nothing. The, the way the calculation is messed up has nothing, doesn't show that the private school is getting anything, any favoritism from our district. But what I'm saying, I hear what you're saying, but what I'm saying is that as voters, all voters, we have an obligation to make sure we get to the poll and vote for the budget. So and we, this is something as we have, a collective, have failed our students So we by have tried to voting. do that. Could you give me something to sell to my constituents how to get that done? How I've asked for two years, I've asked for that. Give me something to ask them how to do it. Give them, give you what? Give me something to be, go out to my constituents and find how I should make them pass the budget. I mean, you have a list of eliminates, eliminations, reductions that's going to affect our students. You think that students. more people are going to show up by the, by the polls high this year because of that? We had the same list there last year. Correct. So as a board member, you have to find I'm, a way I know to what, talk I know to what I'm going to vote. I know what I'm Excuse going to Excuse me one second. I just want to jump in if you don't mind. And I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude. Um, first of all, Mr. Gruber, I appreciate your honesty. And when we get honest up here, I don't want anybody to take offense to it because honesty is good for all of us. Um, any of the comments from the community, 
that were in a form of race baiting is very disheartening. We don't agree with any of that. This, so I just want you to know that as well. I didn't, I, 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 no, 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 no. I, this, didn't I want to say this. Hang on a second. And while it was taking place, I was, I was kind of like sharing stuff with Shimon, like, that's out of frustration, and that may be, a, a, you know, people can't really, they don't know exactly what the specifics are, but they think that's, because that's, that's low-hanging fruit and it's easy. So what we're, what we're saying is, what we're saying is, there are kids that are, there are kids that are homeless that we take care of. There are, I was reading an article one day, and I was trying to find that article, but God, I, I, I deleted it by accident. I was reading this article, and you would have swore I was talking about East Ramapo when I read this article. I was like, wow, they're talking about East Ramapo. And you know what it was? It was 1890s New York City. A rush of immigrants to this country is nothing new. People come here for a better life. Now, um, whatever challenges they may have, we, our job is to try to help their children through the public school system. And all of us, my mom was an immigrant, all of us can look back at one point in time, you some of our it? families were immigrants, I understand that. But there was a point in time somebody helped all of us. They helped somebody in our lineage. When they came here and they needed help, somebody helped them. Because people come here for a better life. We can't blame them for that. So did we, well, so we again, so if I, if I, I just if I may, to share If I may that. say something. I think, I think everyone's getting a little heated and we do have to move on to some of the items here. Um, I do want to reiterate, we welcome all children who come into our district and to our schooling. And we're here to educate and to welcome all of our students. I, my grandparents are immigrants. I believe most of the board of, the, of our, my fellow board members, grandparents are immigrants as well. And we welcome all immigrants as opposed to some other districts who are not as welcoming to immigrants as we are. We're very, as being a grandchild of immigrant, we all support them. We're requesting from the state to make our state funding formula correct so we can continue educating all our students. And I do not, we do not want to do any of these cuts. And that's what we hear. And we're all unified on this instead of each blaming each other and saying it's our fault, it's their fault. We need to unify on this. And the state needs to make it right and fix the funding formula so we can educate all children. Um, I, that, that's my feelings on it. Um, in the interest of time, I, we do have a few, a lot of items to cover, so let's move on, please, with the report. Um, I'm sorry, j just so I can just get this off. I, I, I hear everything you're saying. I understand we need to get the state involved so they can fix formula and do what they need to do to help us, but at the, I just want to make sure that we as a community, we as a board, we do what we need to do on our end to help our kids as well and figure out how we're going to get a budget to pass every year. Come, down, come, come together collectively, come up with different ideas to make sure that we're not in the situation every year. Elected officials have made it clear they're tired of helping us when we're not willing to help ourselves. So, I mean, we have to look at every aspect of the situation and make sure that we do our part as we're asking the state to also step in and help us out. I agree with you 100% on that, and this is what I've said before too. We want, we want to educate, but we need the money from somewhere. My vote on all of this is no. Where is it going to bring me? We are, we are in a deficit of $19 million. I do not want any of these cuts. I, I am, I'm actually going to vote no on it. But we have to come up with the money. The only way to come up with the money, we pay taxes. It's not that we don't pay taxes. We pay a lot of taxes above what we pay, and we are a poor district. We look around the districts, as Harry said before, our average income is more than $20,000 less than Hevestra. And I'm not going to go about Clarkston or Orange Town. They're, they're way above us. We are trying our best. We have to find money somewhere else. Right, because uh, as you were saying, Mr. Group, even if we do pass the 5.38% increase, we're, we're still short 90 minutes. Right. So that's my point about the state, you know, reevaluating the formula, but even based off we're facing a crisis here. We're talking about cuts that I, I, I don't want to cut. You're asking me to make a recommendation. I don't want to cut any of this. That, that's my recommendation. I don't want to cut any services to the children. Ditto. I, I, I want to keep all these services. 
And I want the state to step in and help us. That, that, that's the only choice we have because we're still even with uh, which, which the budget hopefully will pass and we're going to do last year we did we worked very hard to get the budget passed we were this close but even if we get the budget passed this year we're still going to be short 19 million dollars and we still we're still be facing these cuts that nobody wants so i i think we're all on the same page on that um let's well said Jimmy. thank you let's move on Okay, a, a few more slides to go, but um, <laughs> right here I just wanted to, um, every time we um, assume a certain tax levy increase, I put up the chart that we can show the change from one year to the next of what the impact to a taxpayer may be if their house is valued at the effective market value stated up there. Um, so we see that for example, in Ramapo, if the value of a house is $700,000, the equalization uh, factor brings it down to an assessed value of $59,000, um, and then we pay the tax rate on each $1,000 um, of the assessed value. It, the tax owner, the taxpayer may only see an uh, increase in their annual tax bill of $372. Again, I just want to make note that last year I presented, you know, similar schedule um, for both the one point for the 1.99 uh, proposed tax levy increase, as well as the zero percent the tax levy increase, because there's so many factors in the tax calculation. Um, my estimate, since I've been here, always comes out greater than the tax rate that we realize once all those factors are received from the towns. Just anecdotally, mm -hmm. um, this past year with a 0% tax rate and my house value didn't change, my taxes went up because the state reduced the star exemption. Right, so, but the that's school... that's something that we don't right. control, obviously. Don't. I'm just saying there, there are other factors. And when you don't have this, and when you have the salt cap, mm -hmm. that's real money out of your pocket. And when you talk about a district that isn't rich, real money out of your pocket matters. Right, but I mean, there's, there's gonna be a lot of factors in yeah. what we pay, you know, as property owners, but um, the actual tax rate for the school district decreased overall. So just um, going over some of the transportation costs. Um, so the, the trend has been increasing. We know that there's several factors, um, competitive bidding, um, also the bus driver uh, shortage, um, limited capacity, so where we have to put out a few bids because East Round Pole transports, you know, 40,000 students, um, but also the enrollment trend has increased. So we see that this year we have approximately 30,000 students, private school students receiving transportation and 10,400 public school students. Um, we estimated for the enrollment to increase, level out next year around at a 400 student inc pupil increase for, pri for public school and estimated about four thousand on the private school end. So we know that East Ramapo um, provides universal transportation um, just for informing the public that's a voter. It was issued by voter um, decision in a referendum many years ago. And so right here, I, I did a calculation using current numbers, this year's um, cost and pupil count and estimated, you know, and their, their, the proximity of their address to the school they attend. And so I provided three different options that, you know, a possible refer referendum can, can have. And so if we were to look at the state, option one is the state mandate on uh, mileage limits, which is two and three miles, two for K to eight, and three for nine through 12. 
um, the, the district can see a net savings, net of state aid, of approximately $12.9 million. And the second option is a less restrictive and mileage um, refer um, option of one and two miles, one for K to eight and two for ninth through 12th grade. And we can see a potential savings of 11 million. And the last one is providing the mileage limit at 1.5 miles across you know, all the grades of K through 12, we can potentially see a savings of 10.7 million. Natalie, in each of the three scenarios, what number of the 45,000 kids would lose transportation under each scenario? So on the first option one, that's approximately 50%. So 50%, so that would be 20 to 22,000 students. That's at state mandate levels. Um, and the second and third, those range from 12, you know, because there'll be changes of address, 12,000 um, 12, to 13.5 like thousand students. Is it 13.5? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? 13 what? About 13.5. 13,500. Just, um, just looking at this, I understand, you know, what we're trying to do, but I, I did, I was just, oh, I was looking at this and every, all the things that's happening um, here in our area, I, I kind of get where if you had like 7th through 12th, mm -hmm. where, you know, okay, if they lived, um, you know, no more than like two miles, they would walk to school. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm looking at like kindergarten, a kindergartner right. to up like sixth grade. I'm like, well, how does that look if they're walking, just hear me out for a mm -hmm. second, walking to school and we have issues already with children getting hit. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just thinking about the safety, safety concerns. And I'm saying, how would this work? Parents here in this area, they have to work. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be able to, you know, like some parents don't work, where they can walk their kids to school, right. and it's not a bother. But I just don't see how it would work for our parents, especially from that kindergarten to even, I would say, up to like sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, how, would, how would that, I get what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, right. but how would that work when, you know, we have a lot of safety issues? Right. So in our area, I, I understand that there are a lot of safety issues and no sidewalks in, in many, most of the area in Rockland. Um, but the referendum can take different forms. So it can be any scenario beyond the. It has to at least be within the state mandate mm -hmm. level, and then. But That's even even but even so two that, miles. I understand. I'm sorry. I understand. Like I kind of get the the older like the the like I said the, starting at maybe right. seventh grade, mm -hmm. seven through twelve. I could I understand that, but I just have a hard time trying to. I, I thought about this mm -hmm. during the week. I'm like, how would this work when our parents we already know have to work, so mm -hmm. they're not walking them to school. Mm -hmm. So it's just a right. thought. Right. Yeah. yeah. But to follow up on, on, on what Che was saying, I was actually going to bring this up before. Uh, I'm sorry, not before, when we bring up to this item, but being that we're discussing it now. Um, I know we have a separate item about Correct. this uh, about later it. on the agenda, but I guess we can discuss it now. Um, I want to know, you know, as, as in the past, I've, I'm happy to, I always vote and follow along with the recommendation of the superintendent and the monitors. Um, but I am a little confused about this, this, this referendum. I mean, we, we've put up this referendum in the past. I believe the last one was in 2009. And the voters overwhelmingly voted against it. Um, and they voted to keep universal busing. So my question is, what changed now? I mean. How, how do we propose that suddenly the voters are going to vote to eliminate universal busing? I mean, uh, um, we're talking about after in a consecutive, in one month, two children were killed by, by, by buses. Um, parents work. Parents, uh, uh, the, the traffic is terrible. Um, I, 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 don't th I, I don't think this is a gr good idea. I don't think it's going to pass. I don't see the, 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 the way, unless 
maybe the, the, the superintendent or the monitors or maybe the state can, 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 can explain how, if, if there's a, a way of how we're going to get this to pass. I mean, if, if we look at the last referendum, even the voters that voted yes on the, uh, on the, on the budget voted no on the, on the elimination of, the, of universal busing. So what are we looking at that's going to be different this year? Like I said, I support what the superintendent and the monitors recommend, but what, how are we seeing that this, you know, if, do, do we, I mean, I guess you want to hear what the public has to say. That's, you know, fine. If that's what we want to do, we'll put it out again. But uh, I, I, I don't think... Uh, I, I just but not, not, I'm thing. sorry, not, not only that, too. At the last board meeting, we started this discussion um, some of us shared our concerns on safety, and instead of um, a solution on how we can probably rectify the issue, we an item was thrown on the agenda that we're expected to vote it on tonight, on putting to to be able to put this proposition on the ballot, and you know to add to the question that you know my other f fellow board members are asking, what have been done? what outreach has been done to reach out to our elected officials, our county executives, to see how they're gonna help us um, make sure that our kids are safe when they're walking. I mean, me checking the miles alone for my son from my home to Kakiat is 1.7 miles, which means that he wouldn't qualify for transportation, but me knowing how, I personally would not allow my 13-year-old to walk from home up Viola Road to, to, to Kakiat. Um, you know, there's, there's more cars on the streets now, more than ever. I don't think there's ever been an analysis, analysis done statewide, countywide, local, or, or locally to where we can see how we can fix the issues that we have. So if we're talking about educating the whole child by providing a healthy, safe, supportive, engaging, challenging learning environment, where does safety come in to where we're making sure that all 23,000 or 12,000 students are going to be safe and not get hit or ran over when that's already happening once they get off the bus. So now imagine them walking and not even, you know, nowhere getting off of a bus and same thing happen and, you know, we're increasing the, the, the injured, you know, the amount of students being injured or the, the death tolls. Like, have we looked into that prior to this being put on the agenda tonight? And, I also noticed that on the timeline, it said that um, the latest date to approve the board proposition is March 19th. So why didn't we continue choose to continue having this conversation before uh, adding that item to the agenda? I just want to add one thing to what you said, Sabrina, and that's that currently in the town, every week, approximately three to four pedestrians are hit by vehicles. So if you're going to put 13 to 23,000 more kids on walking on the streets, I think the expectation should be that that number is going to increase drastically. And it's not only the kids you're going to put, some parents are going to drive, so the amount of cars are going to shoot up. Our infrastructure is not meant for that at all. So and once again, I know that's an item on that, the agenda. That was a question, so right? If, I just if, wanted yeah. to be sure. Correct. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, I just wanted Make sure everybody, you know, bring it down a little notch tonight. This was something that we had to discuss. We know how the community feels about transportation. Trust me, we do. But we can't ignore the fact that this would be an item that could save costs. I don't want children getting hurt. I know why this community went to universal busing. I know why they did it. I, it's because the blocks don't have sidewalks as a safety measure. But we can't, you know, we have such, we're in such dire financial straits. We can't just walk around acting like this isn't what's, what's, in, what's happening as well. And I'm not, look, this is the community, it's going to be a community decision. But we have to include it. But the we're question saying, is, we're not, but the we're not saying we're pushing anything. We have to just, this is a savings. This is a savings. No, no, I know that. I'm sorry not to cut you off, but the question is not about yeah. the savings. The question is about safety. What are we doing to make sure that our students will be safe? Are we going to add more sidewalks? Have we reached out to our elected officials, our state officials to see how to map out and plan, you know, what this would look like in real life, having all these students walk to school, knowing that there's no sidewalks, knowing that there's a, a certain amount of cars and vehicles on 
um, on the streets now. You know, there's still buses, there's still, um, you know, you know, it's just a lot that I feel like we're not taking into consideration before actually presenting this because I'm pretty sure if we have these questions, parents also have the same questions. And if we want our voters to be comfortable to vote for this, we have to assure them that their child will be safe. We have to make sure that they will be safe just in case they have to walk their child to school because we know, we learn from experience that majority of our parents, especially in the public schools, don't drive. They're depending on cab drivers or Uber or Lyft to, to transport their students. Then it becomes a safety issue because if they're working during the day, they might be able to you know, be in that Uber or Lyft or taxi with them to take them to school, but now what about when they're going home? Am I gonna put a five, six-year-old in an Uber or Lyft to go home with a total stranger? And you know, at that age, a lot of students don't know where they live. So we have issues now where students are left on a bus and you know, parents are worried because students are left on a bus and they don't know where to go and you know, they can't speak for, this, for themselves for the most part. So how are we gonna address those issues? Well, again, I don't, dis I don't disagree with you, but what I will say is a, a, a lot of the concerns that you've expressed, um, we've talked about over time. We know we have to show up the transportation department. We know we've got to get more quality staff in there. We, we know we need a quality director, but we also have to put ourselves in a position where we can attract a quality director. We can't pay a transportation director in East Ramapo like we would for somebody that's transporting three or 4,000 kids. And, and again, we want to improve the services. Uh, I was remiss, let me backtrack. First of all, my heart goes out to the families who lost their children, first and foremost, right? That was gut-wrenching. The whole experience but what I'm saying is we, we, we need to find a way to um, get some kind of infusion of resources because we, we first of all we're gonna have to hire a transportation director that pretty much is going to be on par with um, handling transportation almost with like the city of New York because we're the second in the state behind the city of New York right when we have to pick up a, a number of staff members we have to improve the there's a within the transportation department there's a safety point person we, for the district our size, we need around four of them. And you know, so, so that, that would be something that would tap into the improving safety measures, but we need, we need um, improved resources with that. And, he, and, and Ms. Charles Pierre, even if, we, if nothing is done to touch universal transportation, we still need a quality director in transportation, and we still need around four safety point people. Um, but at the same yeah. time, we mm -hmm. still need to make sure that our students are, whether this passes or not, whether it goes on the ballot or not, we still need to make sure that our streets are safe for our students to walk because we, I mean, at this time, we do have a lot of students from Spring Valley High School, especially once the weather starts getting nice and from Rampo High School, that do walk to, uh, to and from school. But it's still not safe. And if we are gonna go this route, I just wanna make sure that there's a safety plan in place to make sure that we are ahead of the game and not trying to figure things out as time goes along. Because, you know, we've been here before. I mean, I understand what you're saying about staffing. I'm not referring to staffing. We know what needs to be done when it comes to staffing. I'm focusing on the safety of our students. I, you know, I, said, I, don't, just... I don't disagree. Hang on. I mm -hmm. don't disagree. But we, like I just said as well, we need to hire, even for a district our size, I looked at a couple of the other districts that transport a fraction of what we do. And they have, they, some of them have more safety point people than we do within the, the staff of the district. So I agree with you. And like I said earlier, whether, whether this is a consideration or not, we still gotta take care of our house. We still have to get a quality uh, um, director of transportation, and we have to you know, pay them commensurate with the, what their responsibilities will be and what we're gonna re request of them. And we're still gonna need to um, fortify that entire uh, office and add at least three or four more safety point people to the transportation. Mm -hmm. How, whatever you guys decide, that's something we still have to do. Which I understand, but just to, so you know, I, I mean, with all due respect, you're not answering the question. My, mm -hmm. It's still about the safety. Well, it's a circular, we need money to hire people. No, no, We I need know, money but, to hire people. No, no, I and, and that's what's necessary. But what I'm also saying is that in this, when, when it comes to safety, a lot of the safety needs that we need are not gonna come from the district, it's gonna come from 
our local uh, elected officials. What are we doing to have the conversation with them is my question. Well, what that I can tell you about that staff. is last week we had a big meeting with, I would just say it was a who's who of the electeds. We had Congressman, uh, we had Congressman Lawler, we had Congressman uh, Zembrowski, we had um, most of the electeds in the area, we had um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Weber, Commissioner Harmon. McGowan. We had a, we had a we, uh, McGowan was there as well. Yeah, and and they all are aware. They they left the table understanding what the needs were. I believe, and you guys were when I first got here. Explained to me. Well, yeah, definitely. That was that was something we presented as well. Um, but the needs are there's a move, there's a lot of moving parts with the needs, and I agree with you. I agree with you, Sabrina. Maybe I could just add. When we get to the agenda, you, you vote with your heart. This was a cost-saving measure to come up to make the community realize, but to put 22,000 students on the street without sidewalks, you're 100% correct. There is no way to guarantee their safety. As we said, there were two fatalities, and we have universal busing mm -hmm. in the last two weeks. But th that, you know, as Shimon said, we don't agree with the cuts on, on cutting classroom supplies. So that's the list. Oh, great, she said. This was a hard decision. We spent 16, 17 hours a day to come up with this 4.7 million. And we still got a dip in 14 million in reserves. This is not an educationally or financially sound budget. It is not. How we got to this point, lack of voter authorization, and as Harry said, lack of proper foundation aid, it doesn't, doesn't adjust for the combined wealth ratio. Um, we're probably losing close to 20 million a year. All these factors over 10 years, but the fact is we're running out of money July 1st. We won't be able to pay transportation contractors. We won't be able to pay payroll. These are cost-saving measures for the board to consider. And Sabrina, you're 100% correct. So and you know, I understand what you're saying to, to vote my, with my heart. I mean, to be honest, knowing that, um, seeing that timeline where it says that the latest date to approve this board prop proposition would be March 19th, I would prefer if we could table this and if maybe we can be provided with more information on what we're trying to do to um, make sure that we can at least start the conversation with, um, you know, key people who can ensure the safety of our kids. That way, if I have to, you know, have a conversation with voters in my ward and they ask me that question, at least I'll have an answer for them. But right now you're asking to put something on a ballot and, you know, with pretty much no further information based on what our concerns are. And, you know, I, I would just want more information to be provided. Okay. I, I will say this, that the town is putting in sidewalks and lighting in unincorporated Ramapo, so they are working on that. But that's going to be a long, drawn-out process. It's not going to be fixed immediately. There are certain segments. Lighting is a little easier than sidewalks because it's just changing the light. Right. Um, but that being said, you still have 14 villages that have to deal with their area. The town can only deal with unincorporated Ramapo. So they're, and they are doing traffic studies and, uh, but the infrastructure doesn't support the vehicular traffic that we currently have. And this, and you're dealing with county roads and state roads and village roads and town roads and you have multiple jurisdictions that complicates the whole thing. So. Nothing's going, nothing's going to be fixed in two weeks. <laughs> nothing's going to be fixed in two months. Right. Is there a process? There's a process, but it takes time. It takes time. Thank you, Harry, for the, for the updates and the insight from the town. Um, let's, let's continue on, please. Are we f are finished with the superintendent's report, Natalie? I'm sorry. It's <laughs> after 10 already, and we still have another hour in exec, so let's... let's so yeah, so I just want to say that the other budgetary um, need for East Ramapo is that the building condition survey, um, we were informed by the architect that our buildings need 246 million in um, improvements. 
I think I shared this at the last board meeting, if we can have a breakdown of what that 246 million would consist of, um, if it could be provided to us and maybe even shared with the public. Okay, I um, uh, uh, Sabrina, the architects presented a few months ago the billing condition survey. That's what we're talking about. I understand, but if it can be part of the slide or put on the website so people can refer to it is what I'm saying. Okay, let's continue on, please. Okay, so we just wanted to make note, um, just so the community knows in terms of timeline, that um, there will be a budget conversation in April, on Monday, April 8th, from 7 to 8.30 at Cornerstone Christian School, so that'll be one, one of many, but we just want to make sure the public is aware. Ms. Keevy? Ms. Keevy? Kathy? All right. So uh, tonight, school leadership has um, completed the advertising and accepted all the applications. They're closed, and they'll, during executive session, will present to the board the candidates and the recommendations from school leadership. Uh, hiring any staff, including a superintendent, as a personnel matter is confidential. So that's why it's in executive session, not in public session. Next slide. Um, the budget vote, we're talking about the budget here. The actual budget vote, a reminder again, there's a friendly URL, the uh, ercsd.org slash budget vote 24. It's uh, a landing page. From that page, you can link on any of the uh, election topics of interest, such as uh, absentee ballots, uh, wards, checking to see if you're registered to vote, where your poll site is. And a particular interest at uh, this time of year is the link to running for Board of Education trustee. There are um, three wards where trustees are up for vote this year. That's ward one, four, and seven. As I mentioned last meeting, the uh, forms, the trustee candidate petition, and the statement of expenditure forms are uh, up on the website. People can download them, or they can come to my office or to reception if they want a copy, but they, they're free to download it on their own. Uh, the deadline to file your petitions is 5 p.m. on Monday, April 22nd. Any uh, people wanting to run must have submit their petition physically in my office by 5 p.m. that day. The uh, reminder of the budget hearing is May 7, and the actual budget vote date is May 21. And uh, voter registration forms are available online to download, or at every meeting I bring them in the three languages here. And I believe that um, Dr. Ellis at all of his town halls is also bringing registration forms. Thank you. And this is just a reminder, our uh, transportation application deadline is remains April 1st, so please make sure if you are anticipating your child to go to a non-public school that that application is received before the April 1st deadline. Um, we do have this form on our district website. You can complete it electronically or you can uh, complete a hard copy as well. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, before you move on, um, Dr. Ellis, if you don't mind, can you just give us a quick um, update, follow-up on um, the final findings of the Lady Titans um, investigation? Sure. We conducted a, a DASA interview, that's the Dignity for All Act, interview with each student. Um, and at that point in time, um, we sent a letter to the girls. I sent a letter to the girls. I gave a copy to the board, um, shared it with NAACP as well. Um, we're writing a letter to Section 1, athletics, as that was the last game of the season, I was told. Um, and at this point, we are partnering with the NAACP, and they will be um, assisting the, 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 the athletes, parents, in um, escalating a complaint to the Division of Human Rights. It has to be. It has to come from each individual um, family. So that's that's what we're doing. That's what we've done. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis. 
Moving on to consent and agenda items. Do I have a motion for consent and agenda and items one through seven? Move. Moved by Mr. Grossman. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Gruber. All any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Moving on to action items one through sixteen. Do I have a motion for action items one through sixteen? I will move the motion. Do I have a second? A second on, for the purpose of discussion. Second by Trustee McGill. Question on item we'll 15. We'll open it up for discussion. Mr. Fetter. Question on item 15. What's going to happen after the emergency contract for Brown Transportation? What happens after April, whatever, 20? What's the question? I'm sorry. Is that put on a uh, forbid? So that was, that was an emergency quote. Um, right, what happens after that, after the emergency quote? What is it? After the emergency quote, what happens? There's a bid because we can issue an emergency for 30 days and then have an extension for another 30 days. So we have to issue a bid, but this is a contract with a vendor in Albany. Correct, but where's, is, was the bid posted? The bid is not posted. No, we just obtained this contract. This was a special ed placement. Um, Ms. Alexander can speak more to it. Thank you. It was not a CSC placement. The parents parentally placed the child in a residential home in Albany. Um, the CSC did recommend that the child attend a school locally in Albany. As such, we had to incur a new contract to get the child from the residential facility to the program that was recommended. Is, um, it, a, is it an IEP child? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question for number three. Um, I know we were told in the past if we were to ever um, sell uh, anything that we um, owned, that it had to be approved by the, it had to go through the monitors, of course, and the, be approved by the commissioner. And I just wanted to um, ask, was that done with um, the transfer of the parcel for Finkelstein Memorial Library? So I, I sent you a two-page, the board, a two-page memo on this. I could recite all that or I could discreetly answer your question. Given the hour, I'm just going to say yes, which is the discreet answer. Uh, I ran this by Bruce, explained it to, to, to the, the whys and wherefores of this transfer of title, and he ch also checked with SED Council. They are agreeable that this is appropriate. So we do have the requisite consent from the monitor, and that is why it is now before you, because the process we're required to follow for the transfer of land has been followed, okayed by the monitor, so it's green light for the board to approve. Thank you. Um, I have a question in regards to um, item number two. Since our funds are limited, have we considered another option that would be cost efficient? I, I don't understand the question. That's about a policy? No, it's not a policy. I'm looking at I, item number two is hold on, let me go second back. reading and adoption printed, of a policy. A when I printed this out, back. the subject was second reading and adoption, right? The policy? Yes. So I had a question about the policy in regards to having a, an impartial hearing officer. It's a Bec uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Alexander can probably speak better to me, but my understanding is it's a requirement under uh, it, special under, education. Under both IDEA and state law, we're required to have independent hearing officers in special education proceedings. So I can't hear you. Under the IDEA, the federal law governing special education, as well as state law, we're required to have independent hearing officers hear challenges to placements that are brought by parents. So we're required to have this as a mandated policy. We can't not have an IHO. Okay, so th there's no, due to the law, we can't have another option. I'm not saying not have it, but another option. Yeah, I hear what because you're saying. Because I know it, we're in a fi financial crisis. Yeah, so it's, that's not like, it's not like we could appoint 
someone on staff to mm -hmm. serve in this role. The person has to be truly independent, and this is this is a function of of both federal and state law that we have to have this. Okay, and um, also number seven, I had a question on. Um, I know that our Early Childhood Center um, is a program that, in our district, I, I believe they're doing pretty good. They're in good standing. Um, so just question, I know that we already have issues in our other buildings in terms of um, the number, the amount of kids that we have where we don't have the space. We have a shortage in teachers. So I couldn't understand why we were trying to reconfigure by taking out first graders from, because I, I believe ECC has kindergartners, kindergartners as well as first graders. So how would that work? Where would the first graders go if we're trying to reconfigure that? We're reconfiguring it back to what it, its original um, purpose. Uh, last year, we uh, put before the board um, to reconfigure every March 1st if we see a challenge coming. Um, last year, we saw a challenge coming with the increase in space, and so we um, were looking at um, uh, having K-1 and making that consideration. There's been an increase in kindergarten enrollment and with spacing, so it's, it would, it, we have determined to bring it back to what it was, where it's a full day, all kindergarten, and we would um, uh, redistribute the students accordingly across the buildings. So where would you put first graders if we're having issues already in other buildings? Right, so the kindergartners in the other schools would come to um, ECC, like as it was before for many years prior. So we would go back to that. The first grade that we had last year, that we added last year, was due to we had an emergency that previous year with an influx of first graders. So just in terms of those students, we, we had first grade and second grade. So then we brought the second graders back into the K-3 buildings, and now we're bringing the first graders back into the K-3 buildings to bring it to um, uh, all kindergarten. So about how many first graders do we have right now two, at ECC? Two classes. Which is how many students? That's 20, uh, 28 times 2, which is 30, 28 times 2. 40, 40, 56, 56, thank 56, you. 56. I, mean, I, I mean, if it's not broken, why, you know, I don't know, reconfigure it, I mean. Well, it's not that it wasn't, we, we, we reconfigured it because it, there was job. for a point in time. So when we um, spoke about this last year, last year we actually put in to increase to have a first grade. Be so we're bringing it back to its original purpose as an early childhood for kindergarten only. Do we see mm -hmm. an increase in first grade enrollment? We're seeing an increase everywhere. Um, so, in terms of um, that, that's a separate conversation in terms of um, the increased enrollment and capacity, et cetera. But what we're trying to focus on is um, right now you have around 17 classes. So if you have two first grade classes, we're just thinking about the educational progress and where the students are in terms of their learning. And it's best for us to, we can't increase the number of first graders in um, ECC increase the number of first grade classes, it's better for us to go back to... Just leaving it as K, which, which I understand. K. But I do think that we need to, in the future, like really consider... So I, I'm, a, you know, I'm assuming that the first graders that attend Kakiat, they're on that side of the district. So if we were to reconfigure and have them go to the other buildings, that would be Summit Park and Hempstead, if I'm correct. Do we have enough space in those schools in the first grade wing to add 56? Well, it wouldn't be 56 because then they're going to second grade. So is there rooms in the second grade wing for 56 more students to attend those two schools we would on be that shifting. side? So the incoming kindergarten, we would be reshifting and going back to the process we used prior in terms of filling the kindergarten classes with the new incoming kindergarten students. So we would go back to that same process. But I do have to say there is a challenge with you know, the increased enrollment and space that we have to consider. However, in terms of the programming for the students, it is best for us at this particular point in time for ECC to focus on kindergarten and for us to redistribute the students across the other. But you understand what I'm saying? With the, the first graders that are going to second grade, do we have space for them in those schools for in the, them in for this, next year? 
for next year. Because they'll be in second grade next year. Right. Yeah, so we and, do have space for those kids, those students right now. However, I'm just stating the realities of our increase in enrollment. No, no, I understand that. I just yeah. want to make sure that yes. we're also looking at that yes. because there's yes. also an increase and now we're bringing 56 students to those, you know, to whatever school they're going to, but yeah. we also have a space issue, not only in ECC, but also in the other grades um, at the other buildings. Right. So either way, um, we have to, we have to work out the space issue. However, in terms of the programming of the students, yes, those first grade students are, they were being planned to go into their um, feeder school. So now CACAT will be, it's going back to ECC and then four through yes. eight. Yes. <clears throat> and is the plan to leave it like that moving forward or are we still going to look at it every March 1st? We are going, our, our, because I think at this point it's our, only going to. Yeah, our enrollment has changed. We're, li we're thinking about, um, we were thinking mainly about programming of the young people and also the social interactions, et cetera, of the young people. Um, but as we move and we're looking at, we, we definitely need to have conversations, but we will speak on that um, at a future board meeting. Thank you, Dr. Iwa. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? I'm, I'm going to... Um I'm sorry, um, the number 16, I'm sorry, Ms. McGill, why you look. Um, is this not a council that we already have on staff for special education? So, uh, kinda. Um, the firm that had previously been doing special ed or is doing special ed until the end of next week, the firm was, is the firm I formerly was at. The attorneys at that firm have moved to another law firm, Bond, Shenick and King. So this is an appointment of Bond, Shenick and King to effectively maintain the consistency of the attorneys that you had that had up until last week been at Harris Beach. So, so it's the same attorneys, but they're with a different a new, firm? At a new firm, yeah. And has anything changed in terms of um, the fee arrangements? The rates are the same as what you were paying Harris Beach for special ed counsel. The travel arrangement is the same, which is based at the White Plains office of Bon Chenick and King, which was the same as what you had with Harris Beach. So the, so the only thing that's changing is the name of the firm is what you're saying? Yeah, you're lead, yeah. And also just to clarify that Howard Goldsmith, who was our main contact out of Harris Beach, is retiring. I had put that in the weekly board minutes um, with his letter, and that's why we ended up having to go out to find, uh, to stay with the two who are moving to the new so firm. The, and, and the two attorneys that are, would be the lead is Ann McGinnis and Jeff Weiss. Both are um, folks I worked with for, for many years and are exceptional special attorneys. Now, is this the proper process for this, or um, were we supposed to go out for our RFP, or? You, there's no requirement to do an RFP for professional services. The board just did a legal RFP a couple of years ago. Um, given the timing of the move of the attorneys and Howard's uh, retirement, this is the most prudent move for the district to maintain the consistency of its special ed counsel. But if we wanted to look into something else, maybe um, for next year, for example, if we wanted to go out and do an RFP, we, are, we, we can do that. You, you absolutely okay. could do that, yes. Okay, so as I said, we have a motion and a second. A couple of board members voted aye already. Are there any other board members like to vote on this? Yes, um, um, Rosa, yes. Uh, number seven, I'm just going to abstain on it right now because I just feel like we have a bigger mountains to climb. Um, ECC with Ms. Barrows, I believe the program is in our district is doing a phenomenal job. So I think that, you know, uh, Okay, maybe. thank you, Sherry. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll note the, the extension. You. Motions carry. Moving on to item F. Um, do I have a motion? To Chairman, can I make a statement before the board votes? Go ahead, please. 
Well, do you, should we make a motion and bring it up and then we can discuss? Let's do that. So I'll make the motion to have a second. Second by Mr. Gruber. We'll open it up for discussion. Bruce, go ahead. Thank you. In the interest of taking in consideration the transportation dialogue this evening and ensuring additional review of same, we recommend to the board tabling this resolution at this time. So I don't think I understood what you just read. Did you just recommending the board table this resolution? I'm sorry? Table the monitors table. recommend to the board to table, to table this resolution. Thank you. So, so that means you'll now take a vote not on to table the resolution as opposed to pass or not pass it. Thank you. Tabling it means you will put no, it No, no, I, I just didn't hear it. I That's couldn't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we need a new motion to table it? So yes. I'll make a motion to table the resolution. Second. Second. Um, are we doing a roll? Don't we have to undo the motion? Because we there was a motion for what's already on the agenda. Don't we have to undo that and then bring I think, this? I think you would you you or consider Harry's motion to take to. To table it, which is seconded, so now that takes that's the first motion before you. You will vote on that, at which point you no longer consider the motion of passing or not passing this. No, no. What I'm saying is that there was a motion for the, that the original already. Right. Yeah. The, um, a motion. To, a motion to, to table takes precedence over okay. the okay. original Got motion. Okay. I'm going to trust our council on this. Okay. If our council says we're Go going to continue with that. And once, um, once it's tabled, you can't <laughs> vote on it tonight. Okay, got it. Okay. Right. So you now have a motion and a second to table it, and now there should be a call to vote on tabling it. All in favor? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, abstain. Motion carries. Information and reports for the board. Sherry, I got you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. I just want to say one thing because I know it's late. Um, just, you know, let's continue to um, support, uh, make donations to our um, East Tremble families that got um, displaced from the fire on Slynn Avenue. Um, there's quite a few children that's um, in the hotel. So just please let's continue to support them and their families. That's basically it for me. And the last thing, because we've been talking a lot about it, let's get out and exercise our right to vote because it's critical. May 21st. Thank you. And uh, to add, I just want to I just want to thank the district. Um, I know there were two dress downs where money was collected for uh, Sabrina Villa Gomez and for Alia Torres. Um, I know for that one there was about 4,700. Um, dollars raised throughout the district and also there was a dress down um, last Friday for the families that were displaced um, at the Slynn fire um, and I don't know what the total is that was g g given today but um, you know I just want to thank you know everyone who participated and who continues to to help our community as a whole. I have a question regarding... Uh, Thank you, fellow board, Mr. Feder, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> I've been getting uh, certain emails lately and calls from different schools that, uh, cert that rosters are not completed still from last year. The one school contacted me today, 5 o'clock, that there's 165 kids that still don't have student IDs. When they try to call or send emails to transportation, they don't get an answer. Once they get an answer, that they're, they're too busy to respond. Who would be responsible for this? Well, right now, Ms. Um, Espinel has been overseeing transportation, so, you know, if you can just forward anything. I understand Ms. Espinel is busy with the budget and business office. And I, I agree with Mr. Feather. Rosters were in March. No, things are, are things not were not paid, right. underpaid, and there's nobody to talk to, and we get calls all the time. I'll talk to Carla. I know there was one from one of the schools Correct. that we that had to one sort out one by one. You know, they were able to address that one, but I'll sit with her and see what's missing and, and help her sort it out. 
Well, there's a handful of schools that are complaining and complaining, sending emails. President Rose even responded a few uh, last week about uh, one of the schools okay. as well. And thinking about what he just said, to knowing that we have um, short staff in transportation, I know with the uh, April 1st deadline coming, uh, you know, uh, for the, the April 1st deadline for transportation. Um, maybe if we can think about a system that we can put in place temporarily um, until we get the amount of staffing that we need so that when we have phone calls and emails come in that they're being addressed timely because um, we do know we have issues every mm -hmm. year when it comes to yeah. you know people submitting and mm -hmm. um, us not receiving. So um, you know maybe we can start thinking about it now how we can hopefully try to address that when the time comes. Also, what was done f uh, to the accidents that happened recently? Was there any safety measures done from the safety officer in the transportation department? I believe nobody has contacted the schools or the contractors to discuss the accidents. Right, so we did have, um, I sat in on the SED investigation just to make sure that certain things that um, just to make sure that we knew exactly what laws. I mean, we can't point blame. We're not doing the police investigation, but- and At least the courtesy it, of a safety officer to go down no, no, to that's speak not, to them. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that I sat with them to make sure that what is necessary or things that I even thought were necessary, and I sent an email to the board um, stating that those items, certain features of the bus that can be in, and this is not the total reason and the only safety measure, right? Um, certain features of the bus are not required per DOT. Um, for, for one accident, I would have thought that that feature was a requirement, but I did research. I you know reached out to people at the state and other regulatory agencies. Um, but besides that, I told the DOT, the, the SED inspector that I was going to um, sit with him and gather information on better training for the inspector, for the, um, the bus safety inspector, and also I want to at least start bringing bring in one additional person, right? Because we have various contractors. Um, but we emphasize in our document, also in the bid specs, that it is, and in SED language, the bus driver's responsibility to make sure that they are the crossing guard and the safety, the number one safety um, um, person, you know, um, at the, for, for all the children's and making sure that they're aware of um, safety measures when leaving the bus as well as. Um, so what's the job of the safety officer in the district? If it's the responsibility of the bus driver, so what's the job of the safety officer in the district? Well, he makes sure that everything is in compliance as far as 19A, um, he'll do, make sure that the contractors have their bus drills in place. Um, so I'm working with him to I make sure he's gathering. I don't think has happened this year. You don't think that has happened this year? Yes, I verified it. You verified through a contractor? With That's not doing it? The, the okay, they so never then had I would need to have it used additional. To be, years ago, it used to be that the uh, safety officer from the district went down to every contractor and pulled files, looked uh, the fleet, reviewed right. drivers 19As, reviewed uh, DOT records. Right, that is the responsibility. And not and also and doing bus lot um, reviews. Nothing has happened this year by the transportation safety officer. Uh, okay, I, would, I don't think nothing, but I'll, I'll definitely sit with you if you know something that I'm not aware of, oh. specific to specific contractors. I did check into it personally. Okay, Mr. Feder, I think you should talk to, and I'm happy to be part of the conversation and go through about the safety. What, what is the safety officer doing and if what he isn't doing? And if he's not doing what's required of him, you know, he has a job to do and he should be doing a job. Um, future meeting dates, a regular meeting is scheduled for March 19, 2024, 7.30 right here in the PLCC room. 105 South Madison Avenue, Spring Valley, New York. Written communication, since the last board meeting, the board received one email on transportation and education and two emails on busing. I will now make a motion to enter executive session. Kathy. Um, to 
receive advice from school attorney and matters leading to the appointment of a particular person. No action is expected following executive session. Do I have a second on the motion? Second by Vice President Charles Pierre. All those in favor say aye. And on opposed, abstain. Motion carries. Good night, everyone.
have five? Yeah. Including each other. Yes, we have five. Okay, I'll now bring this meeting are, back are we, are to we order. Are we, live? are we live? Are we live? I would like to bring this meeting back to order. I will now make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Second by everyone. All of the favor say aye. 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 And I'm opposed to abstain. Motion carried. <laughs> Thank you. Good have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Who took the first person? She emailed it to us. So oh, she emailed it? Okay.